Welcome back, microbiology students. Uh, and this, in this lecture, we're going to be discussing bacterial morphology. Uh, it is mostly about bacteria, which is why I've underlined, which is why I've underlined bacterial morphology. Um, this is morphology, of course, is the study of shape and form. And we have been dealing with microbes. We've been able to see microbes through microscopes for about 150 years. And in that time, uh, for example, in clinical microbiology, if you were trying to diagnose somebody that had a, had a microbial illness, you would take a sample of their blood or their sputum or their urine or something like that, and you would look at it under a microscope, and you would diagnose which microbe they had been infected with based on its appearance under the microscope. Uh, there were other tests you could do, like you could stain the you know, you could stain the microbes with different types of stains to get further, get additional information about them. Uh, but generally, for probably a century and a century and a half, the main way to identify which microbe was making you sick was to look at the shape of it and the form. And so we're going to learn the background information I sh about this. I should mention that, that this method of identifying microbes is giving way, has given way in the last 20 years to PCR, to the polymerase chain reaction, uh, where you simply look for specific genes that are specific to one, one particular microbe, right? So, uh, but nevertheless, it's still, this technique is still used as an adjunct to, to PCR. It's used in addition to PCR most of the time. So for instance, uh, if you go to Vancouver General Hospital, they have, uh, they have a laboratory in the basement, which is, um, uh, they call, there's a, there's a field called, med, uh, you can become something called a medical laboratory technologist. And what, an, um, what a medical, a certified medical laboratory technologist does is they do all of the testing that doctors do, that doctors request when you're in a hospital. So if they say, oh, we want to see if there's something in your blood, the doctor doesn't actually take the blood him or herself. They, they send for a phlebotomist who does that. A phlebotomist is somebody who specializes in taking blood. And then the phlebotomist will not give the blood to the doctor. The phlebotomist will send it down to the hospital laboratory. And the medical laboratory technologists will look at the blood or the urine or the sputum under a microscope. Uh, some Occasionally, a doctor might look at the results, but this kind of experimental work that's used to diagnose illnesses, including microbial illnesses, is done by uh, people that are called medical laboratory technologists. And if anybody's interested in doing that for a living, British Columbia Institute of Technology, BCIT, has a program in that. It's a two-year program. So you could, finish, you could finish an associate's degree at Columbia, and then you could go to BCIT and, and become a, you would get a diploma in, uh, an MLT diploma, a medical laboratory technologist diploma. And that MLT diploma would give you the right to apply for jobs as a medical technician in hospitals all over Canada. Uh, so the certificate, the, it's a pr professional certification. You can't get a job in the hospital medical lab laboratory without it. But anyway, one of the things that medical laboratory technologists do is they identify bacteria or other microorganisms that are making people sick based on a number of characteristics that that microbe has. And one of the main characteristics is its appearance, its actual physical appearance. So we're going to go through the background information, the, the ways that we have been that we've been classifying bacteria for 150 years or so based on their appearance and their features and certain properties they have. Okay, so again, we're mostly this this particular lecture is talking mostly about bacteria. Okay, so in part one, we're going to talk about how to identify microbes based on the shape, specifically whether they are rods, cocci, or or, or uh, uh, spirochetes, uh, spi spiral in shape, you know, shaped like a spring. And secondly, when you're analyzing bacteria in this way, you would look not only at the shape, but you would look to see how they are arranged, right? So the, do, remember that bacteria divide through binary fission, binary fission. And binary fission means they split in half. Now the question is, after they split in half, do they stay stuck together? Some of them do and some of them don't. Do they divide, if you're talking about bacilli, rod-shaped bacteria, do they divide 
on the broad axis or on the narrow axis? And do they stay stuck together so that they form long chains that look like sausages or something like that, right? Do they look like that? Um, so that we have words to describe those arrangements. So the way that, that we have words to describe cell shape that you need to know, we have words to describe how the cells are organized that you need to know. And then furthermore, do they have other anatomical features? Do they have a cell wall? Do they have a, a flagella? Do they have several flagella? If they have more than one flagella, how are those flagella organized? And then finally, there are certain stains that you can use that will stain one type of bacteria and not another. All right, now, sometimes one of, the, one of the other ways that we identify bacteria and other microbes in general is you identify them based on their physiology or their metabolism. Right. So that means what can they eat? What kind of food can you give them that they can live on? This type of bacteria can live on a specific type of food and another type of bacteria can't. And therefore, if you just give, if you just take a sample of bacteria and you only give them that type of food to eat, if they live on it, you can identify it as being that type of bacteria. If they can't survive on that food, then they must be another type. Right. So much of the identification, the classical methods for identifying bacteria were based on what they could live on, what, what they could eat, what types of sugars, what types of proteins, and so forth. Uh, also, we can also identify them based on whether they are aerobic or anaerobic. As, as you know, uh, there's a term called uh, obligate anaerobe, which means that you must live in an environment that does not have oxygen in it. Right? So if you take a sample of bacteria and you split it in two, and then you put half of it in an incubator that has oxygen and another half that doesn't have oxygen. If it survives in the incubator that doesn't have oxygen, then you know, and but not in the one that does have oxygen, then you know that it must be a, an obligate anaerobe. Right? So what temperatures do they live in as well? That's another question. So can they live in high temperatures? Can they live in low temperatures? Or do they only exist in moderate temperatures? Uh, moderate temperatures being anywhere between 20 and 30. Uh, anyway, so those are all questions that you can ask. And the answers to those questions will help you identify specific bacteria and in some cases other microbes as well. All right, so let's, let's start at the beginning here and look at classification and identification of bacteria based on their morphology. All right, so if a, if a bacterial cell is round, you call it a caucus. If it's shaped like a rod, so it's longer than it is tall or longer than it is wide, you call it a bacillus. If it's roughly one and a half times or you know 1.2 times longer than it is tall, you call it a coccobacillus. A coccobacillus is obviously not round, but it is slightly longer than it is wide. So you call that a coccobacillus. Anything that is more than one and a half times longer than it is wide is classified as a legitimate bacillus. If it's shaped like a comma, you know, like this is a comma down here. If it's shaped like that, you call it a vibrio. If it is, if it is bent and spiral shaped, uh, if it has one or two bands, sorry, if it has one band, it's generally a vibrio. If it has two bands, two or three bands, it's a spirillum. Spirilla are, spirillum is the singular, spirilla is the plural. Generally, a spirillum uh, is thicker than the next thing on the list, which is called a spirochete. A spirochete is very thin. It has many bands. It has many, you know, it's like a spring and it, it's very flexible. And if you look at them when they're alive under the microscope, they kind of, they kind of spring around like those old toys that were called spl uh, slinkies. Uh, I don't know if anyone plays with those toys anymore, but that's kind of what they look like. Now, uh, the difference between a spirochete and a spirillum is that a spirillum has fewer bends and it tends to have a thicker body and it is more rigid. So a spirillum looks like a thick spring with three bends, whereas a spirochete looks like a very thin spring that has maybe 10 bends in it or something like that. All right, now finally, the last word on this list, pleomorphic. Pleomorphic means that the cells have no consistent shape. So when you look at a, if you look at a pure sample of that bacteria, 
some of them are round, some of them are vibrio shaped, some of them are bacilli shaped like bacilli, some of them are shaped like cocobacilli. There's no constant shape, and that's unfortunate because you, if you see that, you might think that you have a mixed culture of bacteria. You might think that you have several different species of bacteria there when in fact there's only one. There's only one species there, but it happens to be pleomorphic. Okay, so here on the left, you can see all of these things. Right, so a coccus is round, a coccobacillus is 1.5 times longer than it is tall or less. So it's so obviously a coccus is round and it is it, it's as tall as it is wide. If it's slightly taller than it is wide, it's a coccobacillus. If it gets to the point where it's 1.5 times longer than it is wide, it's a legitimate bacillus. Now, one thing to notice here is that yes, a coccus is round. But notice that the coccobacillus has rounded edges, and so does the bacillus that's shown here. It has rounded edges. Now, a bacillus or a coccobacillus, either a bacillus or a coccobacillus, may have rounded edges or it may have flat edges. Uh, that's another way that you would identify bacteria, one bacteria from another, whether the, whether the ends of the bacillus are rounded or whether they're perfectly flat. Right, so like a like a like a log that's been chopped into pieces has perfectly flat edges rather than round edges. You can tell the difference between certain bacteria that way. Okay, so this is a legitimate rod, more than one and a half times longer than it is tall. All right, so a vibrio is comma shaped, as I said. All right, so there's a Vibrio. And then this is what real Vibrio look like under the scanning electron microscope. You'll rem remember from, from lecture two that this is a false color SEM. This is a false color scanning electron microscope image. So they've colored the, the back, it started out black and white, and then they colored the background kind of green in color, and they colored the, the Vibrio, um, they colored the, colored the Vibrio yellowish. Right, now below that we have a spirillum. So notice that the spirillum has, two or three bends. It's fairly thick compared to the spirochete. The spirochete has half a dozen bends or so, and it's very thin and very flexible. And if you see them moving under the microscope, the, sp the spirochetes move much faster than the spirilla do because they're more flexible. And then finally down here at the bottom, we have some pleiotrophic bacteria, pleo uh, sorry, pleomorphic bacteria. So they, there's no consistent shape for a pleomorphic bacteria. All right, we're going to do some exercises here, and I want you to, to look, at the, look at the picture, and then you can pause it if you have to, and then I'll tell you the answer. I'm going to ask you to tell me what the shape is. All right, now just looking at the shape of these bacteria, how would you define this shape? These are bacillus, these are, these are bacilli, and in fact, this is bacillus anthraxis, which causes a disease, a blistering disease called anthrax, right? So here we have bacillus anthraxis, and this is a bacillus. It even has bacillus in the name, All right? How would you describe this? Okay, it has rounded edges. It is longer than it is wide. It's not terribly longer. This is a legitimate Cocobacillus. Right, so these are Cocobacilli, and in fact, this is Bordetella pertussis. Right? It causes a disease called whooping cough. You should memorize both of those facts. Right? So Bordetella pertussis causes a disease called whooping cough, which is spread by droplet transmission. It's a very common disease spread between children. Uh, if they're in daycare, daycare centers or anything, they get whooping cough. It's a bacteria and therefore you can kill it with antibiotics, right? So it's easily curable, but it is also highly contagious. It, it, I don't know what the, what the R0 value is, but it's highly contagious. Um, and so children tend to spread it to each other in daycare centers or playgrounds, right? And it is a coccobacillus, right? So in fact, I'll tell you right now, Bordetella pertussis is the only coccobacillus that you will learn in this course. You don't need to memorize any others. But for now, you do need to memorize that Bordetella pertussis causes whooping cough and that it is a, it is a coccobacillus. How would you describe these? All right, the answer is they look pretty round to me. So these are cocci. These are legitimate cocci. Cocci is the plural, coccus is the singular. 
This is Staphylococcus aureus, which is found on the skin. It's part of the skin microbiome. Uh, it's an opportunistic pathogen. It's also a pyogenic path. It's also a pyogenic bacteria. So if it gets into the skin, under the skin, it will provoke the formation of pus. Right? So you do need to memorize what Staphylococcus aureus looks like. Right? Now, uh, that is Staphylococcus aureus. What do you think about these? I'm not talking about the small dots. I'm talking about the big squiggly with things with the squiggly tail. Okay, these, it's a little bit hard to tell. It looks a bit like a coccobacillus. You know, by this point, you know that the tail is actually a flagellum. But what about the body of the bacteria? How would you describe that? It looks a little bit like a, it looks a little bit like a coccobacillus, but if you look at this one down here on the bottom left, you'll see that it's bent. So the body has one bend in it. So it's kind of shaped like a comma. So this is a vibrio. This is vibrio cholera, which causes a waterborne uh, disease that spread through the oral fecal route by water. It has a water vehicle. Right? So vibrio cholera causes a disease called cholera. And it is a Vibrio, so that will be the only Vibrio. You do need to memorize the name of one Vibrio for this course, and so Vibrio cholera, that's the one you should memorize. And you should memorize the disease that it causes, which is cholera. How would you describe these? Okay, one of the tricks to being a microbiologist, uh, identifying things through the microscope is kind of an art form as much as it is a science. It takes a bit of practice to do it. It takes a bit of experience so that you've seen many of them. And one of the tricks to, to successfully identifying these things is to know that most microscopes have most the lenses of most microscopes are better in the middle than they are at the edges. If it's a really expensive microscope, it will be the lenses will be so good that the the image is good all the way to the edge. But if it's a standard cheap microscope like the ones that we use in the lab in the teaching lab at Columbia College, the center of the image is better than the outside. The outside the outside of the vision field, the outside of the field of view as it's called, the outer edges of the field of view are a little bit distorted. So the next time you're looking down a microscope, you may notice that, that the outer edges are a bit distorted. And so if you want to identify the bacteria successfully, look at the center. Right? So if you look at these, the, these two here are a good example. They are quite obviously, what would you think? They're round. So these are, these are cocci. Okay, now this is Neisseria gonorrhea. You do need to know, you do need to memorize that Neisseria gonorrhea is a coccus. It is a coccus. Uh, it doesn't say so in the name, but it's a coccus. And Neisseria gonorrhea causes a sexually transmitted disease called gonorrhea, which is named after the bacteria. So how is it spread? Sexual transmission, gonorrhea. We learned earlier on in the in the section on pathology that Neisseria gonorrhea has special features that allow it to stick to the epithelial cells of the urethra. The urethra in both men and women is located near the sex organs and so that makes Neisseria gonorrhea a perfect bacteria to act as a sexually transmitted disease. What do you think about these? Right, so again you notice down here that the image is a little bit distorted but if you look sort of here that's a good example. Right, what would you guess? Okay, those are clearly cocci. All right, so this is Streptococcus mutans. You do need to memorize that Streptococcus mutans causes tooth decay. All right, what about these? This is a little bit blurry. Um, somebody didn't do a good job of focusing it. And uh, notice that the bacteria are two different colors. Some of them are purple. Some of them are dark blue and some of them are kind of a pink, purpley pink color. That means that somebody, uh, you, you learned this in Biology 110, that you can stain bacteria using the gram staining protocol. The gram staining protocol allows you to tell the difference between something called gram negative and gram positive bacteria. We learned about that in the first lecture. And what this means is that, again, a lot of these techniques are more of an art form than they are a science. You need some experience to do it properly. And so these are, this is actually a pure culture of bacteria, but somebody didn't do a very good job of staining it. They decolorized it too much or they didn't leave the, they didn't leave the iodine there long enough. Uh, the mordant was not applied long enough. And so some of the bacteria ended up staining pink when they should have been stained dark blue. Uh, but anyway, these are, this is a pure culture. And how would you describe the morphology of the cells? These are clearly bacilli. Uh, 
So this is Lactobacillus acidophilus. Where do you find it? Sometimes you find it in yogurt. Sometimes you, you always find it in the human vagina. It's part of the vaginal micro, microbiome. How would you describe these? Okay, these look to me like they are, they are bacilli. So this is Esterichia coli. It gets the name coli from the human colon, which is where they were discovered. Right? So that we have 10, sorry, we have 100 trillion of these in our colon and they are symbiotic with our digestive system. Okay, so these are bacilli. This is Esterichia coli. So you do need to memorize the fact that Esterichia coli, E. coli, is a bacillus. What would you say about these? Look at the ones at the very center of the image. All right, they look squiggly to me, right? Now that leaves the question, are these, would you say these are spirilla or spirochetes? Uh, are these spirilla or spirochetes? All right, to my, to my eye, these look very squiggly and very thin. I would say, I would guess that these are uh, spirochetes. Yeah, and this is Treponema pallidum which causes a sexually transmitted disease called syphilis. And you do need to memorize that syphilis is caused by treponema pallidum. And you do need to memorize that trep treponema pallidum is a spirochete. Okay, so this image is fairly bad, but again, if you look in the center, you might get a better idea. So what do you think about the shape of these? Okay, this is streptococcus pneumonia, which causes pneumonia causes a lung infection. Anything, remember from your other classes that anytime you see the word pneumo or new like this, it probably has something to do with air or breathing. Uh, you know that a pellet gun that fires a, a, a pellet with compressed air is called a pneumatic gun. Uh, if you get infection of the lungs, that's called pneumonia, meaning it has to do with air, it has to do with breathing. Um, they, yeah. Okay, so pneumo refers to air. So generally, if you have pneumonia, it means an infection of the lungs. So this is Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is originally identified from somebody's infected lungs when they came down with pneumonia. Now, there are actually several types of pneumonia, and only some of them are caused by bacteria, right? So pneumonia is a disease of the lungs, inflammation of the lungs, and only sometimes is pneumonia caused by bacteria, and only sometimes is that bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae. All right, how would you describe these? If you guessed Spirilla, then you're right. All right, so this is Helicobacter pylori, which causes ulcers in the stomach. Helicobacter pylori, so you do need to memorize the fact that Helicobacter pylori causes stomach ulcers ulcers, gastric ulcers, and you need to memorize the fact that Helicobacter pylori is a spirillum. It's a spirillum. It's not a spirochete. It's a spirillum. So I see one, two, three bends, and it's quite thick, so it's a spirillum. What about these? Getting a little bit hard to tell. Okay, so this is a this is Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is another bacteria that causes pneumonia, and it, it too is a bacillus. What about this? Again, it's a bad staining job. This is a pure culture of Clostridium botulinum, which causes a food poisoning called botulism, which is transmitted from uh, Clostridium botulinum is a soil organism. It lives in the dirt. Uh, but if it gets onto food because the food is dirty and then that food gets canned, it gets put into a can, you might see the can swell up because Clostridium botulinum is an anaerobic bacterium that likes to live in the absence of air. And when it eats food as a waste product, it produces gases. And so those gases that the, so the Clostridium botulinum is in there eating the food and it's producing this gas that causes the can to swell up. And so this causes botulism and Clostridium botulinum, you do need to know that Clostridium botulinum causes food poisoning. Specifically, it causes flaccid paralysis and it is a bacillus, it's a bacillus. Now, the, this too is, Believe it or not, this too is Clostridium botulinum. And in this case, the Clostridium botulinum is starving. And starvation is often, you know, it, they put it into a bottle with some sugar. They put it into a test tube with some sugar. And as soon as the sugar was all eaten up, the, the bacteria starts to starve. 
And under conditions of starvation, Clostridium botulinum is one of the bacteria that make endospores under starvation conditions. So these little things at one end are the endospore. You might remember from uh, lecture two that you can you can stain for the endospore using a stain called malachite green to confirm that it is actually an endospore in there. Right, so this is Clostridium botulinum making endospores. The other ones that I showed you that didn't have endospores were just commonly called vegetative cells. So this process, when they produce a spore under conditions of starvation, is called sporulation. So you do need to know what the term sporulation means. Okay, so these are sporulating cells on the left, and on the right we have vegetative cells. Okay, so what you just learned is you learned how to distinguish a bacillus from a coccus, from a coccobacillus, from a vibrio, from a spirillum, and from a spirochete. Okay, so these, all of these organisms over here are bacilli, Clostridium botulinum, Bacillus anthraxis, Klebsiella pneumonia, Lactobacillus acidophilus, and Escherichia coli. You do need to know that for quizzes and tests. The only coccobacillus that you will ever learn in this course is Bordetella pertussis, which causes whooping cough. The only, uh, the cocci that we have learned so far, and we'll learn a few more cocci, but these are, these are the most popular ones, not popular, but these are the most common ones that I will ask you about on tests over here, are uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, Streptococcus mutans, Neisseria gonorrhea, and Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus is different than Streptococcus, and we're going to learn how they are different next. Okay, the other shapes, you must memorize these as well. The, 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 probably the only Vibrio that I will teach you about is Vibrio cholera, which causes the, the, the disease cholera. Uh, I, I might teach you a couple of different Spirilla, but for now the main Spirillum that you need to memorize is Helicobacter, Helicobacter pylori, which causes stomach ulcers. And I am going to teach you one other uh, spirochete, which is Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, which is a disease that's endemic to British Columbia. Uh, but anyway, for now, the first spirochete that you learned about is Treponema pallidum, which causes a sexually transmitted disease called syphilis. By the way, syphilis is a transplacental infection, which means that if a pregnant woman has syphilis, the child will be born with uh, bone diseases, various bone deformities. Now, just as a little, as a little aside, uh, you know who the Hunchback of Notre Dame was? The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Disney made a movie called Hunchback, but before that, there was a there was a middle-aged uh, a novel called the a French novel called The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Quasimodo had a hunchback because his mother had syphilis. Right. So uh, in those old Frankenstein movies, you know where Igor the Dr. Frankenstein's assistant has a humped back. Uh, maybe you've read the play Richard III by William Shakespeare. Richard III actually didn't have a hunch on his back, but they, they gave, Shakespeare gave him, a, gave him uh, deformed legs and a humped back. And in all cases, these ancient or these kind of barbaric middle-aged stories, you know, we know better now, but in the old days, they used to, whenever you had somebody who had lots of bone deformities, and they put a character like that into a story, it was to imply that they came from, an, uh, they, they came from a mother who was not virtuous, right? Like you, they, they, were they were trying to imply that the mother was a, was a prostitute or something like that. And so therefore, they, these are bad people because, or they are shunned by society because they're, you know, they were children of an unvirtuous mother, something like that. So that's, that's kind of why these old stories like Shakespeare's Richard III, or The Hunchback of Notre Dame, or Frankenstein, uh, Dr. Frankenstein's story. That's why they used to have all these people around that had bone deformities. Uh, and often, if you had bone deformities in those days, it was because your mother had syphilis when, when, you, when she was pregnant with you. Today, it's easily, uh, it is easily cured by antibiotics, and so it's not even an issue. But nevertheless, um, uh, syphilis is a transplacental disease. It's a transplacental disease. All right, so now let's move on to the next step, which is to, uh, to further identify bacteria by the way the cells are arranged. And this is, as I said, this is all a function of the fact that bacteria divide through binary fission. They, split in, they simply split in half, and if they stay stuck together, they will form a certain arrangement. All right, so if you have 
if they if you have a uh, if you have a uh, cocci that simply splits in half and then stays together in twos, then you refer to that as a diplococcus or diplococci. If you have a coccus that divides and it stays stuck together in a chain or a strip, you call that a streptococci. If they remain in fours, the, the, the word for four is tetra, so you call that, you refer to that as a tetrad. This is called a sarcinia, right? A sarcinia means they stay together in, a, in two groups of fours. It, basically, two tetrads remain stuck together. The cell divides this way, and you end up with two tetrads that are stuck together called a sarcinia. And then if they, if they just kind of divide and continue to divide and divide and divide and never come apart, they all stay stuck together, you call that, you use the word staphylo. Right, so you already know the words Staphylococcus aureus, so now you already know how it should be arranged if you see it under a microscope. Staphylococcus, or, uh, Staphylococcus aureus looks like that. Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes looks like that. All right, what about the bacilli? Well, again, you have a single bacillus. If, if two of them stay stuck together because they divide end on end like that, you call them a diplobacillus. And if they remain in a chain like that, you call them a streptobacillus. Right. Okay, let's have a look at some examples. Again, you tell me the arrangement. All right, if you said that this is a streptobacillus, you would be right. And this is Bacillus anthraxis. So you do need to memorize the fact that Bacillus anthraxis is a streptobacillus and that it causes a disease called anthrax. Okay, here's our old friend again. What do you think this is? Obviously, these are cocci and they're stuck together. So we call cocci that remain in clumps staphylococci. Okay, so this is Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus, to me, always looks like a bunch of grapes. Right, looks like bunches of grapes that you're going to make wine out of or something like that. Okay, what about these? These are bacilli, uh, sorry, uh, cocci that are in twos, right? Do you remember which, this is, you saw this slide in the first half. Do you remember which one it was? Neisseria gonorrhea. Right, so Neisseria gonorrhea, you need to memorize that Neisseria gonorrhea is a coccus, and you also need to memorize that it is a diplococcus and that it causes a sexually transmitted disease called gonorrhea. What about these? If you guess that that, that is a streptococcus, you're right, and so this is streptococcus pneumoniae. What about these? Obviously streptococcus again. So this is Streptococcus mutans, which causes what? Do you remember? Causes tooth decay. All right. Now, what about uh, the plasma membrane versus the the bacteria? All, all every cell of every organism has a plasma membrane, which is made out of a phospholipid bilayer. However, some organisms have a hard substance, a hard shell outside of the plasma membrane, which is called a cell wall. You already know from Biology 110 that, that plants have a cell wall that is made of, of cellulose. And you may remember from first year that, that bacteria have a cell wall, some bacteria have a cell wall that's made of a polysaccharide called peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan. Uh, and so that is the main difference between a gram-positive bacteria which has a peptidoglycan cell wall and a gram-negative bacteria that does not. Okay, so gram-positive bacteria have a peptidoglycan cell wall, and they stain dark purple, blue or dark purple, using the gram stain protocol, versus gram-negative bacteria that do not have a peptidoglycan cell wall, and they stain pink using the gram stain protocol. And every bacteria in the world can be classified as either gram-positive or gram-negative. All right, so a gram-positive bacteria has a plasma membrane made of a phospholipid bilayer on the inside, surrounded by a peptidoglycan cell wall on the outside. Peptidoglycan, you need to learn a little bit about peptidoglycan. You need to memorize a little bit of this. Uh, peptidoglycan is made of a, it's a cross-linkage. Cross, if you cross-link a bunch of chains, you call it a lattice. It's called a lattice. You might remember if you took chemistry, you remember what a lattice is. All right, so it, if you cross-link chains of 
one one uh, uh, one chemical called N-acetylmuramic acid, which is abbreviated NAM, right? I will probably ask you that on a multiple choice question at some point, right? So N-acetylmuramic acid, I remember, you know, when I was your age, I was taking my second year, my first microbiology course in second year university, and I remember having to memorize over and over again, NAM, it stands for amacetylmuramic acid, and then once you've memorized it, it stays with you forever. So you'll never forget it, and that's the idea. And the other monomer that peptidoglycan is made of is called N-acetylglucosamine, or NAG, right? So NAM, NAG, NAM, or NAG, stands for N-acetylmuramic acid, and N-acetylglucosamine. Right, so those two things cross-linked into a lattice is what forms peptidoglycan. All right, now the stain, crystal violet, is a differential stain that sticks to the peptidoglycan with the help of the iodine. So it, it does have an affinity for uh, peptidoglycan, but you can wash it away. So in order to make sure that you don't wash it away, you use iodine to form a covalent bond between the crystal violet and the peptidoglycan so that when you decolorize with um, alcohol, the, the crystal violet will wash away from the gram-negative cells but not the gram-positive cells. Okay, in some cases it also contains tycheoic acid, uh, sorry, tycoic acid, tycoic acid. All right, and if it does contain tycoic acid, we have, we have trouble staining it, and we have to, instead of using the gram stain protocol, we have to use the acid fast protocol. Uh, so acid fast bacteria contain, the cell wall contains tycoic acid as well as mycolic acids. Okay, so gram, now gram negative bacteria are a little bit different. They do in fact have a plasma membrane on the inside and then they also have another plasma membrane on the outside. So they actually have two layers of plasma membrane. Remember that each of those plasma membrane layers is made of a phospholipid bilayer. So there's actually four layers of phospholipids in a gram-negative bacteria. Those four layers of phospholipids are formed into two phospholipid bilayers. So two plasma membranes with a space in between. And that space in the middle is referred to as the periplasm. So you must know that, that a gram-negative bacteria has a periplasm. A gram-negative bacteria has a periplasm, which is a space in between the inner and the outer plasma membranes. Right. Now that, that space, the periplasm, is referred to as the periplasmic space, and then the liquid that you find in that space is called the periplasm. Right. So the space between the two plasma membranes in a gram-negative bacteria is called the periplasmic space, and the liquid that fills that space is referred to as the periplasm. And because just because nothing is ever that simple, the periplasm of a gram-negative bacteria contains a little bit of peptidoglycan. Right. So that's why the crystal violet has a bit of an affinity for both gram positive cell, has a strong affinity for gram-positive cells and a little bit of an affinity for gram-negative cells. The reason why the crystal violet still has a little bit of affinity for the gram-negative cells is because the gram-negative cells do have a little bit of peptidoglycan and it's located in the periplasm. The outer, the outer phospholipid bilayer also contains the endotoxin lipopolysaccharide, LPS. We learned about that during the pathology section. So that's an endotoxin. So every gram-negative bacteria has lipopolysaccharide in the outer plasma membrane. It won't harm you. If it gets into your blood, that LPS won't harm you unless you kill the bacteria and the bacteria comes apart releasing the LPS and that will cause anaphylaxis, that will cause an anaphylactic shock. And remember that LPS is composed of lipid A and the O antigen. The O antigen is probably the most allergenic part. Okay, so remember that bacteria sometimes produce toxins. If they send it out into the environment, it's called an exotoxin. Exotoxins are often proteins, including enzymes. We talked about that before. And endotoxins are where the, where the toxin is an integral part of the, of the cell membrane and is generally not, generally not released unless the cell dies. Okay, so if you, if you come up with an unknown bacteria, you look at it under the microscope, the first thing that 
another, you're trying to describe it to another microbiologist, the first thing they'll want to know, is it gram positive or gram negative? In fact, you won't even see the thing. You won't even see the bacteria unless you stain it. So the first thing you have to do is you, you smear some bacteria onto a slide and then you stain it using the gram stain protocol. And then after you've stained it, you can determine whether it's gram positive or gram negative. But because you've stained it and because you can now see it, you can also tell whether it's a caucus of bacillus, a vibrio or a spirillum and so on. And you can tell whether the those cocci are connected together in chains or, or whether they are diplococci or whether they're single cocci. And then finally, you can also distinguish other features like whether they have flagella or whether they have several flagella, whether they have a capsule or a slime layer, or both of which are called a glycocalyx. Right? So that's how you identify bacteria. Okay, so gram-positive bacteria have a cell wall on the outside. They stain purple with the, uh, with the gram gram stain protocol. Gram negative cells have another cell plasma membrane on the outside and they stain pink as a result of the safranin counter stain, as a result of the safranin which is used as a counter stain in this case. Okay, so here is a picture. This is a cartoon drawing of a bacteria. Here you see the phospholipid bilayer, so that's one plasma membrane. The phospholipid bilayer is made up of two layers of phospholipids that face like this so that the, the round part is the phosphate group which is hydrophilic and wants to be facing outside to the water or inside to the cytoplasm. And then these long chain things are the lipids, the, the, the lipids that want to stay away from the water so they stick to each other because it's dry there basically. And this is a, which type of microscope generated this image do you think? Right, it actually says down there. It says TEM. So this is a trans. This is a th this is a TEM electron microscope image, and notice that you can actually see if you look closely at the cell at the cell boundary, there are two phospholipid bilayers there with a slight a small layer of peptidoglycan in between. Right, so you see there's two layers of lipids. There's an inner and an outer phospholipid bilayer. And in the middle, in the periplasmic space, inside the periplasm, we have a little thin layer of peptidoglycan. So here's another illustration. So this is a gram-positive bacteria. Right, so here we have the plasma membrane. And outside, we have a big, thick layer of peptidoglycan that's many layers thick. Right, that's a nice example of a gram-positive bacterium. Down here at the bottom, we have a gram-negative bacterium that's showing an inner, an inner phospholipid bilayer, an inner plasma membrane, and an outer plasma membrane. In the outer plasma membrane, we have endotoxins. We have LPS on the outside. And then in the periplasmic space, we have a little thin layer of peptidoglycan, just enough to attract the crystal violet, but not enough to hold on to it if we decolorize with if we if we form a covalent bond with uh, if we form a covalent bond with the iodine mordant and then we decolorize with alcohol it, the the crystal violet will wash away and then we'll have just these we counter stain with saffron and you see these nice pink cells All right so lattice of peptidoglycan in the gram positive cell no peptidoglycan not much peptidoglycan in the gram negative bacteria Okay, this is what a lattice looks like. You can see the different monomers of N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramic acid that are linked together, uh, more or less the same in both cases. Okay, so this is, this is another diagram. This diagram actually comes from the textbook. So it's just showing you, uh, in some cases, you have gram-positive bacteria that have tychoic acid on the outside as well. So if we have mycolic acid on the outside of a gram-positive bacteria, you can't really stain it with the gram stain because the gram stain has a hard time getting through the mycolic acid. So if you suspect that something is, a, is an acid fast bacteria that contain, if, if you suspect that it's a, it's a bacteria that contains mycolic acid, you have to do the acid fast staining protocol. And then you can see, and so the, the, the two bacteria that that are mycolic acid bacteria that we're going to learn in this course are the ones that cause leprosy and tuberculosis. So mycobacterium tuber tuberculosis causes tuberculosis, which is a droplet transmitted respiratory disease. It's a coughing disease. And uh, mycobacterium leprae is a touching disease. It, it, it's spread by contact transmission and it causes leprosy. Okay. 
Okay, so remember that, that in gram-negative bacteria, we have lipopolysaccharide endotoxin. So there's the O antigen that's stuck to the outside of the gram-negative bacteria. So there it is again. There's the O antigen, the core, and then lipid A is used to anchor that endotoxin in the plasma membrane. Okay, so that's the LPS endotoxin. Okay, so here's, here's what happens when you gram stain. So here we see gram negative rods mixed together with gram positive cocci. So the gram staining protocol. You tell me now, uh, so remember these colors, and then you tell me whether this is a gram positive or a gram negative. We're going to run through the same series of images that you did before. This time, see if you can memorize or you can tell me what the actual bacteria is, what its name is. All right, so what would you say about this? As I said, the fact that some of these are pink is a mistake. It's a bad, pro uh, somebody did a bad job of gram staining these. But how would you describe the morphology? These are bacilli and these are gram positive bacilli. Do you remember what this is? This is Clostridium botulinum. So you do need to memorize that Clostridium botulinum is a, is a bacillus and it is a gram positive bacillus. And it, it does carry out sporulation. Okay, what color are these? They look kind of pink. Do you remember what these are? What about the shape? Is it a bacillus, a coccus, or a coccobacillus? Okay, so if you remember, this is Bordetella pertussis, which is a gram-negative, a gram-negative coccobacillus. All right, so you do need to memorize the fact that Bordetella pertussis causes a disease called whooping cough, whooping cough, and it is a gram-negative coccobacillus. Okay, what about these? Again, some of these look pink. That's a bad gram staining job. Notice that they're bundled together like grapes. These are cocci bundled together like grapes and they're dark purple. So these must be gram positive cocci. Do you remember what this is? Do you remember what it is? You should recognize this one on site by now. This is Staphylococcus aureus, an opportunistic pathogen that's part of the normal skin, uh, normal skin microbiome. It's a pyogenic bacterium. Okay, what about these? If you said gram-positive bacteria, that's correct. Do you remember, remember what those are? Okay, so that's lactobacillus acidophilus. So lactobacillus acidophilus is a gram-positive rod. It's a, it's a gram-positive bacillus that you find in the vagina, also used to ferment yogurt and so on. Okay, these, what color are they? They're not dark purple or dark blue, they're pink. And do you remember what this, what slide this was? I wouldn't expect you to, to tell just by looking, but this is Esterichia coli. So Esterichia coli, E. coli, is a gram-negative bacillus. Esterichia coli is a gram-negative bacillus. Okay, to summarize what we learned about, we learned that Clostridium botulinum, Bacillus anthraxis, Lactobacillus acidophilus, Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and Streptococcus mutans are all gram positive. Some of them are bacilli, some of them are cocci. And then Esterichia coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Bordetella pertussis, and Neisseria gonorrhea are all, are all gram negative bacteria. Some of, them are, some of them are bacilli, some of them are, are cocci. Okay, so which one are the rods? Do you remember? Which of these are cocci? I mean, sorry, which of these are bacilli? All right, so Clostridium bacillus, uh, Clostridium, uh, sorry, Clostridium botulinum, Bacillus anthraxis, and Lactobacillus acidophilus. It's even in the name, right? So those that is, and then Esterichia coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae are both are all all five of those are bacilli. They are rod shaped. Which ones are the cocci? Well, at this point, you can just work it out by process of elimination. So Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus mutans, and Neisseria gonorrhea are cocci. Okay, now we mentioned before about something called a glycocalyx. A glycocalyx is a sugar coating. If the, if the polysaccharides that form the glycocalyx are well organized, they form a kind of a hard shell, and we call that a capsule. If they're disorganized, they form a sticky coating that's not particularly hard or tough, and we just call that a slime layer. Both a capsule and a slime layer are sticky, and so capsules, uh, glycocalyx is generally a virulence factor. It's a virulence factor that is used to help the bacteria 
adhere to your inner cells. So you remember we talked about exposure, adhe exposure, invasion, adhesion. So both a capsule or a slime layer, a glycocalyx, will usually act as a virulence factor for a bacteria. Okay, so the human immune system is quite good at detecting and destroying foreign proteins. And so it's not particularly good at detecting foreign polysaccharides. And so some bacteria hide behind a cloak, behind a cape of, of polysaccharide, which makes it harder for the human immune system to see the foreign proteins, and therefore it makes it harder for our immune system to get rid of it. So as I said, if it's hard, it's a capsule. If it's soft and sticky, it's, it's a slime layer. So here we have a lovely image on the left, a cartoon image of a bacterium. On the right, it's pointing to the actual structures. This is a TEM electron microscope. It's a transmission electron microscope image. And so we're, because it's a TEM, we're looking at a slice through a bacteria. Somebody actually had to embed bacteria in paraffin wax and then slice them into thin slices using a microtome. So here we have, notice here that here we have uh, the, the drawing that's illustrated here. They've peeled away the outer layers. So the, the outermost layer that's shown here is a capsule. So that's a glycocalyx. And then here, the purple thing is a cell wall. And then the yellow thing is meant to be a plasma membrane. Right? So therefore, this must be a gram-positive bacteria. It's a gram-positive bacterium that also has a, happens to have a, a glycocalyx. These things, this thing in the middle here is meant to be the circular chromosome. So remember that bacteria have one large circular chromosome that happens to be supercoiled. Supercoiled is what you get. If you imagine you take a rubber band and you put the rubber band between your two hands and then you roll it. You just roll your two hands together and then you roll up the rubber band. Instead of being a nice loose band, it's a ball. And that, that's an example of supercoiling. So the, the, the bacterial chromosome is a singular circular chromosome that is supercoiled. So that's what's shown in the center there. Right? And then all of these little dots are meant to be 70S ribosomes. One of the main differences between bacteria and eukaryotes is that eukaryotes have a larger ribosome called an ADS ribosome, whereas bacteria have a, regular bacteria have a smaller ribosome called a 70S ribosome. Now, the reason why that's important is because some of the antibi antibiotics that kill bacteria specifically, they do this by targeting the 70S ribosome that bacteria have and leaving the 80S ribosome that humans have alone. It doesn't, the antibiotics affect and destroy the 70S bacterial ribosome while leaving the 80S human ribosome alone. That's how one of the large classes of antibiotics is able to kill bacteria. Okay, so we saw the supercoiled chromosome, and then over here we have a non-supercoiled, a smaller circle, which is meant to be a plasmid. So remember that pl uh, bacteria have smaller accessory chromosomes called plasmids, right? And then this thing here is meant to be a pilus. We'll talk about that later. These things down here are meant to be flagella. So there's three flagella sticking out. And then these little hair things are meant to be fimbriae. Okay, so there's the, the, the surface all peeled back so that you can see that this particular bacterium has a plasma membrane, followed by outside of that you have a cell wall, a peptidoglycan cell wall, and then we have a capsule, a glycocalyx outside of that. So this is clearly a gram-positive bacterium. Okay, so again, examples of bacteria that have capsules are Bacillus anthraxis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and Klebsiella pneumoniae. So those are three that have capsules. In the case of Bacillus anthraxis, it, it's not a big deal because Bacillus anthraxis generally doesn't get inside the body, but uh, Streptococcus pneumonia and Klebsiella pneumonia are spread by droplet transmission from other people who have pneumonia. And so you can, you, can get, uh, you can get coughed on and get those things into your bloodstream. They make their way to the lungs uh, where they like to stick to the lung epithelial tissue uh, using the capsule. And then Streptococcus mutans is an example of a bacterium that has a slime layer. And remember what it does, it causes teeth to rot, causes tooth decay. So the, the Streptococcus mutans slime, slime layer allows the bacteria not just to stick to the tooth enamel, but it also, um, 
if you look at somebody who hasn't brushed their teeth, the teeth are covered with several microorganisms. They're covered with bacteria, fungus, and even a few prot protists. Uh, plaque, you, you've heard your dentist tell you to brush your teeth to get rid of the plaque. Well, the plaque is actually a mixture of food, fungi, bacteria, and a few protists. It's quite disgusting if you see it. It's a, it's a mixture of several disgusting things. And the Streptococcus mutans is able to stick inside the plaque with the help of its slime layer. So the slime layer of Streptococcus mutans actually helps all of these things stick together and form what's known as a biofilm. A biofilm, in this case, we call it plaque. Okay, what other features could they have? They could have flagella, cilia, fimbriae, and something called the F pilus. F pili is a plural, pilus is the singular. All right, so as we learned previously, a flagellum is a long motorized whip. Uh, the word flagellum is actually the Roman word, the Latin word for a whip, right? So when you, when you talk about flagellating somebody or you talk about self-flagellation, those, uh, those are expressions, those are metaphors in the English language, but they come from the, from the Latin word flagella, which is a whip. So when you say, let's, let's, flag let, let's flagellate ourselves, that means let's whip ourselves on the back Let's, in other words, let's feel guilty and punish ourselves because we've been bad, right? So a flagellum is a whip that is used for swimming and it is made entirely of protein, which means that it is immuno, immunogenic. Right? So the, the human immune system has, is not, doesn't have any trouble finding bacteria that have flagella unless they are covered with, somehow covered with a, a glycocalyx. Okay, cilia are, now this is interesting because cilia are small motorized fingers that are used for swimming but they are, cilia are not usually found in bacteria. They are found in protists and, and other, they are found, cilia are a characteristic of eukaryotes. So I said that this lecture is mostly about bacteria. This is an exception. Cilia, cilium singular, cilia are found in protists and um, also, you know, they're found in the human trachea and they're cilia, the human, cells that line the human trachea are ciliated and the cells that line the fallopian tubes that take eggs from the ovaries to the uterus are also ciliated. Right, so cilia are motorized fingers, but bacteria do not have them. That's a, it's a eukaryotic thing. Okay, fimbriae are non-motorized hairs and uh, they are a bacterial thing, not a eukaryotic thing. So, you know, there are not many structures in the human body that have hair-like structures, not many cell types that have hair-like structures attached to them, uh, but there are lots of bacteria that have fimbria. Fimbriae is the plural, right? So pilus, pila, an F pilus is a stick that bacteria use for mating. Uh, there's a type of, a primitive type of mating that bacteria do that's referred to as conjugation. Conjugation. Conjugation literally translates as, it means to come together, to join together is called conjugation. Right. So um, uh, bacteria, some bacteria can actually mate provided that they're stuck together. And one of the bacterial features that allows two bacteria to stick together is called an F pilus, an F pilus. Right. The word pilus is Latin for spear, by the way. All right, so let's look at these features. Okay, so you can see here there's a pilus, right? There are some flagella, right? And there are some fimbriae. Okay, so there are flagella. Um, cilia, as I said, are usually a protist thing. Uh, there are higher animals, multicellular animals like humans that have cilia inside the trachea and the fallopian tubes, uh, not in the intestine. What you see in the intestine is something entirely different called microvilli, that's entirely different. Cilia are motorized, microvilli are not. So cilia can, are used for swimming, right? So here we have, this is, this is in fact a protist, a type of protist that's called a ciliate. It gets, the, the family name comes from the fact that they are covered in cilia that they use to swim around. This is a paramecium, and a paramecium is a member of, group, is a, member of a group of protists that are called ciliates. 
So here's a paramecium again. So this is a protist, and this, uh, the one on the, the picture on the left is a false color SEM, and the picture on the right is not colorized, but it's just looking at it from a different angle. So you can see all of these wonderful cilia that line the outside and which this uh, paramecium uses to swim. Okay, so there are the fimbriae, right? And there's the pilus, right? flagella. All right, now, Using flagella for propulsion is kind of interesting because any bacteria that have, they use flagella to swim and they generally have the ability to spin these curly little whips. They can spin them clockwise or counterclockwise, right? And whether or not they actually move forward when they're trying to swim depends on whether they spin them clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, we'll talk about that later. All right, so now if you have a flagella, versus many flagella. That's another way to distinguish different bacteria. Right? And then if you have many flagella, how are they organized? That's yet another way to classify bacteria. All right, so if you have one flagellum, you, will, you do need to memorize these terms. If you have one flagellum, you are said to be monotricious. If you have two flagella at opposite ends of the cell, like this, right, you're said to be amphitricious. If you have several flagella, if you have two or more flagella and they are at one end of the cell, so when I talk about one end of the cell, obviously we're talking about bacilli because there is no end if you have a round caucus. Right? So if you're talking about bacillus, if you have one flagellum, you're monotricious, that could apply to both a, 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 a rod or a caucus but generally it applies to rods, right? So if you have one flagellum, you are monotricious. If you have two flagella at opposite ends, one flagella at each end, you're amphitricious. If you have two or more flagella located at one end only, you are lophotricious. Here's a lophotricious bacterium right there, right? If you're completely covered in flagella, you are paratricious, right? So here's a paratricious bacterium. And if you have two or more flagella at opposite sides of the cell, you are amphilophotricious. And I don't have a picture of an amphil amphilophotricious bacteria. That's why I waited until the end to discuss it. But if you took this one here and you put two or more flagella at each end, you would classify that as being amphilophotricious. Okay, again, you tell me the arrangement of the flagella. So remember, Monotricious means one flagellum at one end. Lophotricious means several at one end, two or more at one end. Amphitricious means one at each end. Amphilophotricious means more than one at each end. Paratricious means covered. Here again is the diagram, right? So you can see monotricious, lophotricious, amphitricious, paratricious, and amphilophotricious. Okay, so you tell me how the flagella are arranged. All right, if you guessed for this one, if you guessed paratricious, you would be right. E. coli is paratricious. So you do need to memorize that E. coli is a gram-negative bacillus and it is paratricious. Okay, if you guessed that these are monotricious, you'd be right, and this is Vibrio cholera. So if you, so you do need to memorize that, that Vibrio cholera is a monotricious vibrio. Okay, if you guessed, if you guessed that these are low, this is lophotricious, you'd be right, and this is Helicobacter pylori. So you do need to know that Helicobacter pylori causes stomach ulcers. It is a spirillum, and it is a, it is a lophotricious spirillum. Uh, this is you notice this is the uh, picture that you see on the on the front of the Moodle page for the course. Okay, what about this? It's, I see three bands and I see two flagella, two on each end of this. So how would you describe the body shape? Right. I would describe that as a spirillum. And because there are, there's not one at each end, there are two flagella at each end. This is an amphilophotricious spirillum. This one is called Spirillum volutans, which you have not learned about yet. It's perfectly harmless. It lives in fresh water. 
so it doesn't cause any diseases that you have to memorize. But if I ask you to give me an example of a, a, an amphitricious bacteria, you can tell me Spirulum volutans. So you should memorize that. Okay, so example, if I ask you, if I ever ask you for an example of a monotricious bacteria, you say Vibrio cholera. If I ever ask you for an example of a lophotricious bacteria, say uh, Helicobacter pylori. If I ever ask you for, well, specifically, if I ask you for a lophotricious spirillum, you would say lophotricious, you would say Helicobacter pylori. Okay, amphitricious, amphilophotricious flagella examples, you would find that arrangement of flagella on spirillum volutans, and you an example of a peritricious bacteria would be Escherichia coli. Okay, as promised, I forgot to tell you about the swimming and whether the bacteria that have the flagella are spinning it clockwise or counterclockwise. So bacteria move by rotating their flagella. They spin them. If they spin them clockwise, it results in a type of ba a bacterial movement, which is referred to as tumbling. And when bacteria rotate their flagella clockwise, they tumble and they stay in place. So they just look like they're flopping around meaninglessly. But if they spin their flagella counterclockwise, they move forward in a type of movement called running. Right, so the, the speed at which a bacteria moves, generally bacteria that have flagella, they are always spinning them, but they're, they're always spinning them. They never just sit there resting. That's not something bacteria do. They're quite energetic. But if they, if they are spinning their, so they're, they're always spinning their flagella, but they're not always moving. So the, the speed, the general speed at which a bacteria moves depends on how much time it's spending tumbling versus running. Right? And so if they want to move, they spin their flagella counterclockwise. If they want to stay in place, they spin them clockwise. Right? So if you spin your flagella clockwise, you tumble in place. If you spin them counterclockwise, you run forward. You are running. Okay, so there's a flagellum on the left, and that is that is a bacterium. That's Vibrio cholera. And then on the right, we have a paramecia. Uh, it's not paramecium, actually. It's, an, it's another one of the ciliate family, but it's covered in cilia. Right, so the fimbria. Two examples of bacteria that have fimbria, Klebsiella pneumonia, as well as Neisseria gonorrhea. Right, so Neisseria gonorrhea uses the fimbria to stick to the urethral, epi uh, urethral epithelial cells. Right, so here we see two examples of uh, fimbria. Notice that the bacterium on the upper right has both flagella and fimbriae, and the bacterium on the left is just covered in fimbriae. So there's a, there's a difference between fimbriae and flagella in appearance. Fimbria are shorter and thinner, and flagella are longer and thicker. So you should be able to tell the difference between a fimbria and a flagella by looking at it. Okay, so let's talk about the function of the F. pilus. Okay, now uh, it is used. It is uh, the F. pilus can be used for conjugation or a form of mating. Can be used for can be used for conjugation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or it can be used for simple attachment. So we mentioned the fact that Streptococcus pneumonia has a pilus that it can use for either mating with other bacteria, or it can be used to attach itself to the inside of your lungs, which makes it very difficult to get rid of. That's one of the reasons why uh, Streptococcal pneumonia is so difficult to get rid of. So as I said, the word pilus is a Latin word meaning spear. Right. And uh, this is what it looks like if you have a bacteria. So one of these bacteria is spearing the other one. The actual purpose of doing that is to, the spear allows the two bacteria to be stuck together. And uh, th this allows the, the bacteria that, so first I should mention that the, bac the, the pilus is encoded by a gene that is, pl is present on a plasmid called an F plasmid. Now, a cell that has the F plasmid is capable of making the pilus, and we call that an F plus cell. We call that an F plus cell. Right? 
An F plus cell will spear another cell, usually an F minus cell, and it will trans bring it close and then transfer the F plus plasma. It will transfer the F plasma to the F minus cell. And then the F minus cell will have the plasmid, and then it too can, or you know, it will trans the F plus cell will transfer a copy of the plasmid to the F minus cell, and therefore the F minus cell will then become an F plus cell, which is capable of making a pilus and capable of mating with other cells. Right. So that's called bacterial conjugation. When uh, this is when an F plus cell mates or conjugates with an F minus cell and then transfers over a copy of the F plasmid, thus turning the F minus cell into an F plus cell. That's called bacterial conjugation. Okay, so one, one type of cell carries a plasmid called the F plasmid. And the one that the, the F plasmid has a gene that allows that cell to build a protein stick, basically. It builds a protein, a spear out of protein and uses it to spear another type of cell. Any cell that doesn't have the F plasmid is called an F minus cell. So if an F plus strain spears an F minus strain, usually of the same species, it will transfer the F plasmid over to the F minus cell and the F minus cell will become an F plus strain. Right? That in and of itself is fairly harmless, but while they're conjugating, the, the cells may also exchange other plasmids that have genes and those genes code for antibiotic resistance. So that's how uh, bacteria are able to spread evil genes to each other because the, they, they, these plasmids contain genes that allow them to, to stand up to and resist and withstand being attempts to, you know, being killed by antibiotics. So you've heard of superbugs. We're going to talk about those later. Uh, basically, superbugs arise because some bacteria have some gene of some sort that allows them to become resistant to the antibiotic. And if you kill off all of the bacteria that don't have that plasmid, then the, the ones that do have it, they will constitute a larger fraction of the population and they can spread it around to all the others. And then you end up having the rise of superbugs. You end up having more bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotic. Okay, so this occurs either this occurs quite easily through bacterial conjugation, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to ha it doesn't necessarily happen because an F plus cell speared an F minus cell. Okay, so there we have there we have it. On the left, you can see uh, we you can see a cell that's actually making two pili and spearing another cell, and on the right we have one that's just making one pilus. All right, now. The H, the, there's another phenomenon that we have to learn about which is related to bacterial conjugation, and that is called the creation of a high-frequency recombination strain, which is known as an HFR strain, an HFR strain. Okay, now, what happens is that when an F-plus strain, strain spears the F-minus strain, it simply transfers over the gene that codes for the F-pilus. That's no big deal. Right. But those of you that have taken genetics may realize that, that if you have different fragments, different pieces of DNA in a cell, they can sometimes become fused together. Right. So the F plus gene is, co is carried on a, on a little tiny plasmid. And then in addition to that, we have that great big huge supercoiled bacterial chromosome in the cell as well. Right now. Occasionally, the F plasmid will integrate, it will integrate itself into the main chromosome, and then it's still an F plus cell, but instead of transferring over when it conjugates with another cell, instead of just transferring over the F plasmid, it transfers over the whole chromosome. It, it transfers over all of its genes. And that's called an HFR strain because when you, when you transfer genes from one cell to another, that's called a recombination, as some of you that have taken genetics know. Uh, so recombination, when we're talking about recombination of bacterial genomes, any of these bacteria where the F plasmid has accidentally integrated or inserted itself or become fused 
within the main bacterial chromosome, that, that bacterial cell will be called an HFR strain because it has the ability to transfer any or all of its genes to another, another bacteria. Right? So that's what an HFR strain is. Right. So I might ask you a question about that, but don't worry about it too much because it won't be worth very much. I just need you to, I just need you to have thought about that a little bit. Okay, so we mentioned superbugs and conjugation. So this is where one bacteria contains, carries some kind of a gene that allows it to resist being killed by an antibiotic. And when we get to lecture 13, I will explain how that works. But suffice it to say that, um, Usually the gene is an enzyme of some sort that, that deactivates the antibiotic. And the more bacteria that have that gene, the more resistant bacteria there are in the world. And so we are, we are at a point now where in, in the history of medicine where the antibiotics that we've been using for the last century are starting to not work anymore. And they're starting to not work anymore because, because these bacterial strains are, uh, these bacterial strains are passing the genes back and forth. They're passing the antibiotic resistance genes back and forth, sometimes through conjugation, often through conjugation, but sometimes not. And so some bacteria carry plasmids that carry genes that give bacteria resistance to certain antibiotics while others don't. If the resistant bacteria can transfer their resistance genes to non-resistant bacteria, then we have uh, our antibiotics are less effective because they, they can kill fewer of these bacteria. Right? So if you have, it's particularly problematic if you have resistant bacteria going into the sewers. Uh, so sometimes in the laboratory we deliberately build bacteria that are resistant to certain antibiotics and then ideally you're supposed to kill them in a machine called an autoclave after you're finished experimenting with them. But if some scientists are lazy and instead of kill, you're supposed to kill them with the autoclave and then pour them down the sink. If, if you have a lazy scientist who just pours them down the sink instead of killing them first, then you, you will get a lot of antibiotic resistance. Uh, but that's not the main way that, an, that resistant antibiotics are, uh, anti, that's not the main way that resistant bacteria are actually created. Uh, we'll talk about how they're created later on. All right, so this diagram here, and we will come back to this later, this is showing the rise of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So you've heard of MRSA. So uh, the first antibiotic that we ever discovered was penicillin. And then there's a whole family of derivatives of penicillin. We call them the penicillin family, right? And then there's some other, there are some other antibiotics that we've learned about. Uh, eventually the bacteria, the bacteria are starting to catch up with us so that there are more and more bacteria that are resistant to all of these antibiotics. And so there's a sort of a antibiotic that we use as a last resort. It's the last antibiotic that we use because it's fairly strong and it has negative effects on the person who takes it because, you know, it, it ideally a bac ideally an antibiotic should just kill the bacteria, but certain antibiotics will also do minor damage to the human as well. So obviously we avoid using those antibiotics except as a last resort. As a last resort, meaning that we tried all the ones that don't harm the human and they didn't work. And so we have no choice but to try the one that will harm the human as well. And so methicillin is one of those. And so it's considered to be a, an antibiotic of last resort. And you can see that in 1989, if you, what they do is when people come into the hospital with illnesses, the doctors that treat those people keep statistics about uh, how many of the bacteria that are being treated are resistant to the bacteria. And so way back in 1989, you can see that probably about 2% of the hospital cases of people that were infected with Staphylococcus aureus, only about 2% of the time was that Staphylococcus aureus resistant to methicillin. Look what it is in 2002. It's nearly half. Right, so as soon as we get to 100, as soon as this graph gets to 100, the human race could, be very, could very well be finished because we'd have no way to stop uh, staphylococcal infections uh, or any of these other things. So, so uh, there are many people who are working on other ways to kill bacteria uh, because we're, we're quickly running out of antibiotics. All right, so that's the pillus.
All right, let's talk about endospores and sporulation. Right, so here we have a starving bacterium that makes a copy of its chromosome, puts it over at one end, and then breaks off. It, it builds a, a wall called a septum. And then eventually you've got this little spore, a haploid seed, if you will, inside the cell. And it will, when the cell dies, it will come out. And so here you have a bacteria with a large endospore inside it. It's actually a fairly small bacteria. Right, so examples of, you do need to memorize some examples of bacteria that make endospores. Two examples are Clostridium botulinum and Bacillus anthraxis. Clostridium botulinum, of course, gets into food. And usually what happens is you say, well, won't, it, won't, won't we kill the bacteria if we cook the food before we can it, before we put it into cans? And that's true. You will kill it. if You will kill Clostridium botulinum by cooking it. However, if it is producing endospores, it is much, much more difficult to kill the endospores than it is to kill the vegetative cells. It's much more difficult to kill the endospores. So usually when a can of food has become contaminated with, with botul botulism, it wasn't the cells, it was the, it was the uh, endospores. All right, now here's an interesting thing. So Clostridium botulinum, that's one thing. Uh, anthrax, Bacillus anthraxis cause, causes a disease called anthrax, which is, we, we learned in the pathology, in the pathology uh, lecture that, uh, that uh, anthrax can get into the lungs, it can get into the respiratory route. It gets in if you inhale the endospores. Right? And if it gets in, remember that an anthrax causes uh, destruction of the connective tissue which leads to bleeding and weeping ulcers. A weeping ulcer, a bleeding ulcer is where you have a, you know, there's a blister that bleeds. A weeping ulcer is you have a blister and there's a little bit of little bit of blood, but mostly serum, like saline serum coming out. Right? So the anthrax causes runny sores, runny blisters. If you inhale these spores and the anthrax the spo anthrax spores germinate, they hatch inside the lungs then you end up with weeping, bleeding sores inside your lungs, and your lungs fill up with liquid, and then you suffocate. It's a terrible way to die. Uh, there was a period of time when different, you know, uh, irresponsible, maniacal, even evil governments were um, uh, experimenting with using anthrax spores as a biological weapon, as a weapon of ter a terrorist weapon. Right, so uh, the idea is, uh, and I say that you know, these days we talk about terrorists as being groups of people that like to kill other people for purposes of politics. That would be by my definition of a terrorist. And specifically, they like to kill people. They specifically, uh, you know, soldiers uh, soldiers kill people, which is bad. But they try to avoid killing civilians who are not enemy soldiers. Right. So as opposed to terrorists who deliberately target civilians and they generally kill them in a way that causes terror. That's the whole point. And they do this to affect political changes, right? So that's what terrorism is. Now, at, for, from that perspective, Bacillus anthraxis endospores was an ideal terrorist weapon because it kills you in a very terrible way that many people don't understand. Uh, you, you don't have to put it onto a rocket and fire it across the ocean. You simply put it into a letter and then somebody opens up the letter and then they inhale the endospores. Now, it generally wasn't used by terrorists because the equipment, you need special equipment to grow Bacillus anthraxis. You have to get the Bacillus anthraxis and it's not easy to get. Uh, people who, who work in government laboratories can get it from government supply centers. But most regular people would not be able to get Bacillus anthraxis easily. Uh, so, and then once you you have to grow the bacteria, then you have to starve them, and then you have to dry them out. You need a machine called a desiccator, and then you have to grind them up with a mill, and then you grind them up into a fine powder, and so that they can become airborne. They are, they can become aerosol. They can be spread in dust uh, the way you know the way other aerosols are. Uh, so it's not something that terrorists have used very often. Occasionally they have, uh, but it's a it, it is a kind of a terrorist weapon because you put this powder into an envelope and then you mail it to somebody. So this, what you see here in this picture, is an envelope uh, it, it, just shortly after the terrorist attacks in the United States on September 11, 2001. 
uh, politicians started getting letters that said, uh, you know, die politicians, die death to America or something like that. And they contained this white powder. Uh, so somebody was trying to kill American politicians with anthrax spores. In fact, they never succeeded in killing one, one politician, but they killed secretaries who opened the politicians' letters for them. And uh, it turned out that it was, a, it, was, it was actually an American scientist who worked in a government laboratory who was sending those things around and pretending to be a terrorist. He was just a nutcase. Okay, virulence factors. We talked about these virulence factors in the pathology section. Let's just review quickly. Right, so how to, so when we're thinking about these virulence factors, fimbria, uh, pili, and so on, ask yourself the question, how do any of these characteristics on the right-hand side of the page, how do they affect the ability to enter a host, the ability to stay inside the host, that would be adhesion, the ability to invade the host's, uh, the host's uh, cells, exotoxins generally, uh, ability to extract nutrients from the host. Again, exotoxins are quite good for that. So we've, we've gone through all of these characteristics. Think about which of these characteristics could be virulence factors, and if so, how would they work? Okay, so how do we see these anatomical features? We've gone through this a little bit before. So generally, microscopes have different types of stains in light microscopy. A general stain is something that stains everything. A differential stain will stain one thing but not something else. And as we mentioned before, if you use a differential stain, you have to counter stain with something else. And then finally, immunolabeling is where you attach a stain to an antibody, an antibody that will stick to a specific protein. And so uh, immunolabeling is a form of very, very specific staining. Okay, so the gram staining protocol, you start out first by, you take your bacteria and you fix it onto a slide, usually by heating the slide. You pour a little bit of, you drop a little bit of crystal violet onto it. It will stick to the peptidoglycan cell wall. Then generally you, uh, you, you add some iodine, which forms a covalent bond between the crystal violet and the peptidoglycan. Then you decolorize with alcohol to wash away the crystal violet from the gram-negative cells, and then you counter stain with safranin, which stains everything else pink. Right. Safranin is an example of a general stain. Crystal violet is an example of a differential stain. Okay, so safranin is a general stain. Crystal violet is a differential stain. Okay, so the way you do the gram staining protocol, once again, you smear some bacteria onto a slide. Generally, you would mix it with a little bit of water first, so it's not so thick. It's not spread so thickly over the glass slide that you can't see the shape of individual cells. That's the idea of mixing it with water. So you take a, you take a wire loop. You might remember this from first year biology. You take a wire loop and you dip it in some water and then you, you scoop up a colony from a Petri plate and then you smear it around on the cell and then you, you pass the cell through the flame of a spirit lamp a few times in order to fix the bacteria onto the slide. Then you take the primary differential stain, that's crystal violet, and then you add the mordant iodine to, to make a bond between the two, and then you decolorize by pouring ethylene, or sorry, uh, ethanol over it, and then you counter stain with safranin, and then you basically just shake the safranin off, and then you look at it directly in the microscope, and you will have stained blue gram positive versus pink gram negative. Usually it comes as a kit. So you remember at first year biology 110, you had these little bottles that came as a kit. That's generally how the gram stain comes. You buy it as a kit. You smear the bacteria onto a glass slide like so. Okay, now other stains, we talked about the fact that if you have a gram-positive cell that has mycolic acid in the cell wall, you can't use the gram stain because it doesn't work very well. There are tricks that you can use to make it work, but it generally doesn't work very well. So you can stain it using, using a technique called acid fast staining, which is used to stain mycobacteria. So any members of the, of the genus mycobacterium, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, you would use the acid staining protocol. You remember that there's another stain for the flagella, 
which stains the, it thickens and stains the flagella at the same time. Endospores are stained with malachite green, and then the cell body itself is counterstained with saffronin. And you can look for a glycocalyx by negative staining with India ink, for instance. Okay, chemical staining versus immunolabeling. Okay, this is where you take, uh, you purify a protein from a bacteria, for instance. Let's call it protein X. You inject that protein purified into a rabbit or a rat. The rabbit's body perceives protein X as a foreign protein, and it produces antibodies that will stick specifically to that protein. So then you take those antibodies out of the rabbit's blood and you attach a stain to them. In this case, it's an enzyme called horseradish peroxidase. And then you put those antibodies onto your slide and the brown stain will stick specifically to the areas where you find protein X. And then in this case, you counter stain with a blue stain so you can see where everything else is. So that is staining versus immunolabeling. Immunolabeling is a very specific type of staining that will stain only one specific protein. It's very, uh, a very good way to stain and identify and localize just one specific protein. Fluorescent immunolabeling, you do exactly the same thing, except you attach fluorescent dyes to the antibodies instead of an enzyme or a, or a light microscope dye. You can also do immunolabeling with the scanning electron microscope and the, and the transmission electron microscope. In this case, you attach microscopic particles of gold to the antibodies, and these dark spots here are where the antibodies went. Right. And it doesn't, doesn't work quite as well with scanning electron microscopy, but you can see these kind of light spots on the surface of that cell. That is colloidal gold as well. Right. So in microscope imaging, you stain with osmium tetroxide, which is a metal if you're doing TEM, and then you would do immunolabeling with colloidal gold that has been attached to antibodies. All right, so what you've learned to do today is you've learned how to identify microbes based on the shape of the cell, the arrangement of the cells, whether or not they have a cell wall, whether or not they have flagella, and if they have flagella, are they arranged in a polar fashion? Right? Are they arranged on one, one pole or both poles if we're talking about bacilli? Do they have fimbriae or pili? Can they make a pilus? Do they make endospores, which you can stain with malachite green? Okay. All right, now let's talk a little bit about bacteria identification through physiology. Mainly, what do they eat and what, where can they live? All right, first of all, let's talk about mesophiles versus extremophiles. A mesophile is a bacterium or any mi microbe for that matter, or any animal. In fact, this, this, this terminology applies equally to animals as it does to bacteria or any other microbe. So a mesophile is some organism that lives in moderate conditions. That means, generally means room temperature, between 20 and 30 degrees. It means living at neutral pH, low salt conditions, and low pressure, right? So, so at sea level, we have normal pressure. We could consider that to be normal pressure. So any bacteria or any microbe that lives, likes, prefers to live at room temperature, neutral pH, a low salt concentration if they're living in a liquid, and live at normal pressure would be considered a mesophile. Right, so you need to know what the word mesophile means. An extremophile is a microbe that lives at extreme conditions, high salt concentration, an acidic environment, or a basic environment that has a low pH or a high pH, or high atmospheric pressures. We call those extremophiles. Next, those are the, those are the environmental conditions for mesophiles and extremophiles. Second, do they eat, do they need to eat a lot of food or do they prefer eating only a little bit of food and they actually are killed if they live in an environment that has lots of things to eat, right? You know, you know that, that's, that's fairly obvious, right? So an organism that, that does best, that grows best if it's an environment with lots of food is referred to as a eutroph. And an organism that likes to prefers to live in an environment where there is not much food is called an is called an oligotroph, an oligotroph. Right, so the word oligo means a few, 
Right? You might have heard of the fact that you know most countries are democracies. An oligarchy, a democracy is where all the people decide on their government. An oligarchy is where only a few people decide what the government does. That's called an oligarchy. So the word oligo means a few. So a eutroph is a microbe that likes to live where there's a lot of food. An oligotroph likes to live where there's only a few foods, only a, a little bit of food. And generally, too much food will damage it. All right, some more terminology which you must memorize. An acidophile is, an, is a microbe that lives in an environment with a low pH. It prefers that. Sometimes they can live in moderate pHs as well, neutral pHs, but they, they, they can certainly thrive in an acidic environment. An alkophile is a microbe that lives in a basic environment with a high pH. Remember the word phile means to like, means to like. So a bar, an, as, an acidophile likes to live in an acidic environment. What would you call, specific, how would you specifically describe a microbe that likes, that, that hates to live in an acidic environment? Right, you would call that an acidophobe, an acidophobe, phobia. Right, so an acidophile is a microbe that lives in a low pH environment. An, alka, an alka, alkalophile, an alkalophile lives in a basic environment with a high pH. A barophile lives in an environment with high pressure. The word bar comes from millibars of mercury because um, when you measure the atmospheric pressure, you use a machine called a barometer. A barometer is filled with mercury and it, it has uh, little gradients, little grades, gradations on the side of the tube that are called millibars, bars or millibars. So pressure is measured in bars or millibars of mercury. So therefore we call atmospheric pressure is measured that way. So we call any microbe that likes to live in a high pressure environment as a barophile. So the word barophile refers to high pressure environments. Okay, thermophile needs no explanation. Thermo means heat. So a thermophile is an organism that likes to live at a high temperature. A psychrophile is an organism that likes to live at a low temperature. That one is not obvious, right? So a psychrophile lives at a low temperature. A halophile likes to live in a high salt environment because salt is made of halogens. Right, so the, so a halophile is a is an organism that likes to live in an environment with high salt. For example, there are places in the world where you have uh, you have lakes that are sitting in the middle of deserts, and those lakes tend to have a very high salt concentration because those lakes arose from evaporation of the sea. Right, so the something happened so that there used to be the the sea used to be there. There was some change in the environment. You know, uh, there was a tectonic plate activity, so there was a big mountain range that rose up and cut the sea off from the cut that lake off from the sea. So you ended up having a saltwater lake, which then evaporated and evaporated. And every as it continued to evaporate, the concentration of salt got higher and higher and higher. Right, so uh, that is so so that's where you would find bacteria living that are classified as halophiles. There are some bacteria that like to live in a, in a regular low salt environment, but they are capable of living in a high salt environment, and we call those halotolerant, halotolerant. All right, Thermus aquaticus, where do you think it likes to live? The name actually tells you all about it, right? So Thermophilus aquaticus likes to live in a, in, a, in a high temperature. In fact, Thermophilus aquaticus lives on the ocean floor near volcan volcanic vents. Thermophilus aquaticus is not only a thermophile, but it's also a barophile. Okay, Lactobacillus acidophilus, you can figure out where it likes to live. It likes to live in an environment where there is a low pH. All right, let's review some of the terminology having to do with oxygen requirements for certain microbes. <clears throat> so an obligate aerobe is an organism that absolutely needs to live in oxygen. It will die without, uh, without oxygen in, in the environment. Um, these organisms, obligate aerobes, tend to be very energetic. One of the problems with living in an oxygen environment is that if you mix uh, if you mix oxygen with water, 
you mix O2 with H2O2, you will usually generate a little bit of hyd hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And hydrogen peroxide is very dangerous and toxic to proteins in particular, but to living things. And so typically the thing that divides, the, the most conspicuous feature of an obligate aerobe is that it will have <clears throat> it will have special enzymes that are able to convert H2O2 back into H2O and O2. So it will be able to convert uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is a liquid, back into gaseous oxygen and water. And so usually, an obligate aerobe is an organism that that has the enzymes necessary to carry out the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Uh, that we talked about when we were discussing the mitochondria, but they also must have peroxide enzymes of some sort. Right? So obligate aerobes are microbes that cannot live without oxygen. Humans, for instance, are obligate aerobes as well. You know, we, we, wouldn't, we can't live without oxygen, and, and there are many microbes that can't live without oxygen either. Okay, an obligate anaerobe, the word obligate, of course, means obliged to, it means it's not, it's not uh, a voluntary decision. You must do this. So an obligate anaerobe is obliged to live in an, in an area where there is no oxygen. And usually this is because they, don't have, they do not have peroxidase enzymes that convert hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. <clears throat> okay, those are the two extreme types of organisms, one that cannot live with oxygen and one type that cannot live without oxygen. Okay, then we have some interesting flexible organisms in between. A facultative anaerobe is an organism that prefers to live in an oxygen environment. It can generate much more ATP, much more energy if it, can, if it has access to oxygen because it's capable of carrying out glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain so it can generate much more energy if it has oxygen. However, if it's living in an environment without any oxygen, it can sort of live as well. It doesn't generate as much energy, but what it does is it takes glucose, it takes whatever polysaccharide or, glu for example, glucose, uh, takes whatever polysaccharide that it's eating, and it ferments it. It converts it from uh, a polysaccharide into an alcohol, like methanol, or, or in some cases an acid, like lactic acid. So the living in an environment that has no oxygen, these organisms are much less energetic, they have much less energy, but at least they can survive in that environment. But, you know, left to their own devices, they would prefer to live in an oxygen environment. Uh, obviously, the most conspicuous example of that that we've learned about so far is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, because you know, of course, that if you uh, if you take sugar and water and you put in Saccharomyces cerevisiae into this sugar water, and the Saccharomyces cerevisiae has access to to oxygen, it the Saccharomyces cerevisiae will actually carbonate it will produce carbon dioxide as a waste product. So in the presence of oxygen, in the presence of oxygen, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae will produce carbon dioxide as, uh, as a waste product, and it will convert the sugary water into a fizzy soft drink, essentially. Uh, in fact, that's the, that's the way that they used to make soft drinks. Originally, they would take sugar and water and some flavors, and then they would put in Saccharomyces cerevisiae and leave it in the presence of oxygen. And the Saccharomyces cerevisiae would make lots of carbon dioxide bubbles that it would put into the, into the liquid. Okay, now if you take Saccharomyces cerevisiae and you put it in grape juice and you put it inside a bottle and you close the lid, you close the cork, it will run out of oxygen fairly quickly and it will switch to anaerobic fermentation where it takes the glucose that's in the grape juice and converts it into ethanol. All right, so it prefers to live in oxygen, but if it can't, it, it does this. All right, now there's another type of organism called an aerotolerant anaerobe. This is interesting because it, it, it's an anaerobic organism that doesn't need oxygen to survive, but it can, unlike some obligate anaerobes, it is actually able to live in an oxygen environment even though it does not use the oxygen. It actually does not use the oxygen. 
it it simply has it, it so usually what that means is that this isn't this is a microbe that does not have the enzymes needed to do the Krebs cycle, and it does not have the enzymes needed to do the electron transport chain. It has the ability to do fermentation, but it doesn't have the ability to do the Krebs cycle or or the electron transport chain. But it does have peroxide enzymes, and the peroxide enzymes are able to detoxify the hydrogen peroxide so that they can so that they can live. Right. So they are technically anaerobes. They can't utilize oxygen to generate energy, but they can survive in an oxygen atmosphere. Okay, now finally, the last one on the list is a microaerophile, and it needs, uh, it does need oxygen to live, but it is killed by having too much oxygen. Uh, usually the reason for that, it, you, so usually what's happening there is that these microbes, they have the enzymes to do the Krebs cycle, and they have the enzymes to do the electron transport chain, but they do not have peroxidase enzymes to detoxify hydrogen peroxide. Right. So they like to live in an oxygen environment, but they can't live in an oxygen environment that is too has too much oxygen. So they like to live in an area where there's a little bit of oxygen, but the air is kind of stagnant and stale air. There's not a lot of oxygen. Typically in, uh, in, in, in regular air, if you're outside walking around, the percentage of oxygen in the air is about 21%. Uh, Microaerophiles are happier with an oxygen content of maybe 10 or 5 percent, a lesser amount of oxygen. All right, now here's an interesting thing, which is uh, this is this is a much more common way to classify bacteria these days, uh, since we've become experts at analyzing DNA. Uh, this is where we divide bacteria into two groups. Uh, well, into three groups, actually, depending on the amount of GC pairs that they have in their DNA, in their nucleic acids. So you know that there are four nucleotides, A, A, T, C, and G, and you know that A and T bind together through hydrogen bonding, and you know that G and C bind together through hydrogen bonding. Now, most organisms like humans, for instance, have approximately the same number of GC pairs as they do AT pairs, right? So that's kind of what most organisms do. But there are some organisms that have, so, so typically the, the amount of GC pairs in the genome should be about 50%. That's what most organisms have. But there are some organisms that have more than 50% GC pairs in their genome. And we, we say that those microorganisms have a high GC content. And there are some organisms that have less than 50% GC pairs in their genome, and we refer to those as microorganisms with a low GC content. Right? And that's another way that we can classify all living things on Earth, including microbes. So some microbes have a 50% GC content, some have left, less than 50% GC content, some have more than 50% GC content in their genomes. And we will actually uh, in, in next week's lecture, when we deal with the important bacterial phylogen, phy, uh, uh, phyla, we will actually discuss the fact that some uh, very important bacteria have a high GC content and some very important bacteria have a low GC content. Okay, so we already learned that bacteria are generally divided into either gram-positive or gram-negative. That's the one way that we classify. We put all the bacteria in the world into two groups, gram-positive or gram-negative. In addition to that, we now classify them all as whether they have 50% GC content in their genomes versus more than 50% versus less than 50%. If they have greater than 50% GC pairs in their genome, we say they are high GC content bacteria. They have a high GC content genome. And if it's less than 50%, we say they have a low, uh, a low GC content. All right, now let's move on to some other characteristics that we can use to classify bacteria. All right, the term hemolysis means the ability to destroy red blood cells. Hemo refers to blood or blood cells, and lysis, lysis means to break apart or to tear apart. Right? Now, some uh, uh, bacteria have the ability to destroy cells, including red blood cells. 
Uh, and so we have a very quick and easy way to test this. That is, we put, uh, you know, we normally when you grow bacteria, you grow them on these things called petri plates. And what you do is you take a polysaccharide called ag uh, called agarose, sorry, called agar. Uh, agar agarose is derived from agar, which we'll discuss later. But but agar is a polysaccharide that is, if you heat it up to around 70 or 80 degrees Celsius, it's a liquid. If you let it cool to room temperature, it's a semi-solid. It's a soft solid. It feels kind of like jello. And generally, if you want to grow bacteria, you take some agar and some water, and you take some sugar and some amino acids, and you, you heat it up, and then you pour it into these little round plastic plates that are called agar plates. Right, so we have our agar plates. And then you, you let it cool down. It becomes a kind of a soft solid. And then you put the bacteria onto the plate and it will grow there. Now, uh, it will form into colonies, in fact, uh, little, round, little round spots that are called colonies. Now, we have a very simple way to test whether a bacteria has the ability to destroy cells or not. And that is we simply get a hold of some sheep's blood or some cow's blood and we put the we mix the blood with the agar and then we put the bacteria on top of those plates and we call those agar plates right so they sorry they're referred to as blood agar plates right so regular agar plates are where you just mix together the agar and the sugars and the amino acids and you you melt it and then pour it into the plates and let it solidify blood agar plates are where you take all of the stuff that you put into agar plates and then in addition to that you add blood you add blood cells. And then you look to see if the bacteria, where you have bacterial colonies, you look to see if those bacterial colonies have actually lysed or destroyed the blood cells. Okay, now we actually classify bacteria according into, we, we put bacteria into three different groups depending on how, on whether or not they can break apart red blood cells. And so this is a little bit counterintuitive. It, this is a little bit, um, it's not quite what you'd expect based on logic, but I didn't make the rules. I'm just explaining the rules to you. So you call a bacteria, you say that a bacteria is alpha hemolytic. Alpha hemolysis is where you have partial destruction of the red blood cells in the agar plates, right? Okay, so typically what happens is the blood agar plates are red in color. And if you, if you look at just agar plates, they are a transparent yellow, a yellow color that you can see through. Right? If you look at blood agar plates, they are red and they are opaque. Opaque means you can't see through it. Right? So if you put bacteria onto a blood agar plate and then you see the red, the red color around the bacterial colonies disappears, but you see yellow, but it's it, it is opaque yellow or a greenish yellow. What that means is that the bacteria destroyed those red blood cells, but they were not able to completely eat the hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin that was inside those red blood cells is still in the agar and it remains opaque. Okay, so in other words, alpha hemolysis is partial destruction of the red blood cells, but not complete destruction. In beta hemolysis, you have complete destruction of the red blood cells, and all you can see is the transparent yellow agar. Right? So alpha hemolysis is partial destruction of the blood cells. Beta hemolysis is, is complete destruction of the blood cells. And gamma hemolysis is no destruction of the blood cells at all. So there's no dis uh, if, you, if you put the bacteria onto the plate, the bacteria grows into colonies, but you don't see any clearance you don't see any destruction of red blood cells around the colonies. Okay, this is a regular agar plate. So you can see that it's, it's, fill, it's, a, it's a round plastic dish that comes with a lid, right? So this part up here is the lid, right? And then this is the body of the agar plate. So you melt, you mix sugar and water and agar and some amino acids together and you melt it and then you pour it into this plate while it's molten and then you let it solidify when it cools down. So that's a regular, that's what a regular agar plate looks like.
And if you if you streak bacteria, if you take a wire loop and you get some bacteria onto the end and then you streak it across the plate, you see this pattern of colonies growing. So these areas where you see solid lines, that is uh, where the bacteria was, uh, was on the wire loop and it was so dense that it didn't, uh, it, it just deposited solid bacteria across the loop. But this area here is where the you were streaking the bacterial cells across the plate and they were so dilute that they formed individual colonies. So the theory is that one colony arose from one cell that was put there the night before. So you take your loop and you streak it across the plate. Eventually you will rub all of the bacteria off of the loop until the bacteria are so dilute that you're, you are essentially putting one cell at a time onto this plate and then you put the plate into an incubator, a nice warm incubator that allows the cells to multiply and divide every 20 minutes. And so where you had one, one cell on the plate the night before, after 20 minutes you have two cells, and then after 40 minutes you have four, and then eight, 16, 32, 64, multiplying exponentially until in the morning after eight hours or so, you have enough bacterial cells in the same place that they form a colony. And that's actually what agar plates are used for. They're used to, uh, uh, you know, if you have a mixture of bacteria, for instance, in a liquid, and you want to find out which types of bacteria are in the mixture of bacteria, you would streak them on a plate until you get colonies like this, and then you would take samples of each of those colonies and then look at each of them under the microscope and then see what type of bacteria you have. And so that's a way of uh, by streaking them on a plate, that's a way of separating them, basically, so that you have, if every one of these colonies arose from one cell, then you can actually analyze the colony and you can see how many different types of bacteria you had in that mixture. Okay, so here, somebody has streaked bacteria on a regular agar plate. These are blood plate, blood agar plates. Okay, so over here on the right, you can see that Somebody has streaked the bacteria down the middle of this plate. They streaked the bacteria across this plate, and it didn't actually do anything to the red blood cells. Right Now here in the middle, we have alpha hemolysis, which is partial destruction of the red blood cells. So you can't really see, you know, you can see that the red color is gone where the bacteria are. Uh, because somebody has been streaking bacteria across this plate in a zigzag fashion. And, and the, 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 the cells have been destroyed, so the red color is gone, but there's this kind of opaque green color around the bacteria, and that's hemoglobin. Okay, then over here on the left, we have beta hemolysis, which is complete destruction of the red blood cells. And I don't know if you can see the fingers through the bottom of this plate, but the fact that you can see the fingers on the other side of this plate means that you're actually looking through the transparent agar. The, the, the cells and the hemoglobin are completely gone, and all that you're left with is the transparent agar, which you can see through. So I said that this was a little bit counterintuitive. It's a little bit uh, not what you'd expect, because you would expect that if you go alpha, beta, gamma, alpha, beta, alpha is the first, beta is the second, gamma is the third, you would expect that uh, if, if you were naming this, name, this classification system, you would probably say, well, let's have complete hemolysis be alpha, and then partial hemolysis be beta, and then no hemolysis will be gamma. That would make more sense, wouldn't it? But obviously you weren't around to name the system when it was invented 100 years ago and somebody else was not as clever as you and so they didn't think of that. So uh, anyway, that's the way the system works. The, the, another way to classify bacteria is to ask whether they are alpha, beta, or gamma hemolytic. Uh, here somebody's done a very clever thing. They took a blood agar plate and then they took a loop of bacteria, three, th a loop of three different bacteria, and they actually drew the uh, Greek letters onto the plate so you can see what they look like. So you can see there's a, on the right-hand side, there's a beta. That's, a, that's the Greek letter beta. And you can see that the 
that the uh, red blood cells have been completely destroyed and you can you're just looking through the yellow transparent agar and on the left there's an alpha up there where you can see that the cells have been destroyed but it's still opaque and then down at the bottom that's the greek letter gamma and you can see that the colon the, the bacteria are growing on the plate but they haven't actually destroyed any of the red blood cells all right now there's another way that bacteria are classified some bacteria can ferment lactose, as you know, like lactose, uh, lactobacillus acidophilus is able to uh, eat lactose, which is a sugar found in milk. It's a polysaccharide found in milk. So you eat the lactose and then converts, for basically ferments it into an acid, lactic acid. Uh, so there are some bacteria that can do that, but the majority of bacteria cannot. In fact, the uh, a lot of the bacteria that are part of the normal gut microbiome, the bac symbiotic bacteria that live in our digestive system, that live in our intestines, most of those can actually lac uh, ferment lactose. And uh, most of the ones that live outside on our skin cannot. And that makes perfect sense because humans drink milk and eat dairy products that contain lactose. And so probably those bacteria are all, we're already living on the yogurt or the cheese or the milk that we drank. And so when we ate the, the, the yogurt or the cheese or the milk and we brought them into our intestines, we brought those bacteria with, with the food and they just stayed there. They said, well, this is, this is a great place to live because there's lots of lactose in here. So they just stayed there. Okay, so we classify bacteria as well by whether or not they can ferment lactose. Okay, we have a special type of agar to do that as well. It's called McConkie agar. And McConkie agar is very special because not only does it, uh, it is what's called, uh, it's called, it's a differential and a selective medium. Uh, medium means the food that you eat to live, basically, or medium means what the bacteria grow on or live on. Okay, so we just mentioned the fact that, that, uh, we just mentioned the fact that blood agar plates are, allow you to differentiate between bacterial cells that are alpha, beta, or gamma hemolytic. And as a result of that, we say that the, the uh, blood agar is a differential medium because it allows you to differentiate between alpha, beta, or gamma hemolysis, or between alpha, beta, and gamma hemolytic bacteria. Okay, now McConkie agar is is also a differential uh, medium. And what it is, is it, it contains crystal violet um, and it also contains a pH indicator. The pH indicator will turn red if the pH in the agarose plate drops. And so you know that lactic acid, if you ferment lactose into lactic acid, that causes the pH to drop. So that's why we know that in the, in the human vagina, for instance, the pH is low because the, the lactobacillus acidophilus is eating any lact, uh, lactic, uh, lactose that it can find in the environment and converting it, into, uh, converting it into lactic acid. And so the pH drops. And so the McConkie agar contains a pH indicator, which will tell you if the pH is dropping within the area of a certain bacterial colony. And so those colonies will appear pink or uh, purplish pink in color to indicate that the bacteria that are growing on it can actually ferment lactose. If they can't ferment lactose, well, and I should also mention that obviously you have to put lactose into the agar to make McConkie's agar. Uh, in it, so if the bacteria can't ferment lactose, the colonies appear gray. If the bacteria can ferment lactose, the colonies appear pink. OK, uh, so you do have to put lactose into the McConkie plate. Now, the other thing is that the McConkie plate also contains crystal violet, which makes the plate appear a little bit purple in color. If crystal violet sounds familiar to you, that's because that's the dye that we use during the gram staining protocol. Right. And crystal violet sticks to peptidoglycan. And it just so happens that if you try to grow bacteria in the presence of crystal violet, Gram positive cells cannot grow because the stupid crystal violet keeps sticking to the peptidoglycan and they, they can't build a cell wall. 
because the this dye keeps on sticking to the peptide or glycan, which is preventing them from building a proper cell wall. Right, so McConkie agar also tells also inhibits the growth of gram positive cells. So if you're looking at McConkie plates and you see colonies growing on it, you know that they must be gram negative cells. Right, so McConkie's agar is what's known as a is a, is as a selective medium because it selects for it only it selects for gram negative bacteria and it selects against gram positive bacteria. And furthermore, if the bacteria that are growing on the plate are pink versus gray, then you can differentiate between lactose fermenters and lactose non-fermenters, bacteria that can ferment lactose versus those that can't. So we say that McConkie agar is both a selective and a differential medium. The selection part is that it will select for the growth of gram-negative bacteria and select against the growth of gram-positive bacteria. And the differential part is that it can differentiate between lactose fermenters and lactose non-fermenters. Blood agar plate allows all of the colonies to grow, whether they're gram-positive or gram-negative, so it is not a selective media. But it is a differential medium because it allows you to tell alpha, beta, and gamma hemolytic bacteria. Okay, so to review, McConkie plates inhibit the growth of gram-positive cells because it contains crystal violet dye, and the presence of crystal violet dye prevents gram-positive bacteria from building a cell wall. When we're staining, when we're staining bacteria to find out if, if they're gram-positive or gram-negative, the cell wall has already been built, so it doesn't matter. But if you're trying to, if you're a bacteria, if you're a gram-positive bacteria cell and you're trying to grow, you can't really grow in the presence of crystal violet because it interferes with the with the construction of the cell wall. Okay, so McConkie is a different is a, I'm sorry, it's a selective media because it selects for gram negative bacteria and selects against gram positive bacteria. It is also a differential media because it allows you to differentiate or tell the difference between lactose fermenting bacteria and lactose non-fermenters. So if, the, if that particular bacteria has the ability to convert lactose into lactic acid, you will see the colonies appear pink in color. And if it can't do that, they appear gray in color. So here we have a McConkie plate that somebody has streaked. Uh, they've just drawn a zigzag in three different types of bacteria. On the left, notice that, uh, um, uh, well, on the, on the left, notice that the, the bacteria that have been streaked there are not pink. They're colorless or gray, right? So they cannot ferment lactose. Now, the bacterial cells that have been streaked on the right side of the plate are pink in color. You see this nice pink color appearing there. And that is the pH indicator, which means that they can actually ferment lactose. Right? And then the colonies in the middle are partial lactose fermenters. That means that they can, uh, they can ferment lactose into lactic acid, but just not as well as the ones on the, on the right-hand side. So this is a McConkie plate. So a McConkie plate allows you... Uh, it tells you uh, two things. If you streak a bacteria, if you streak an unknown bacteria onto a McConkie plate and it doesn't grow, what can you tell about it? You tell me. What do you know about it? And the answer is, if you streak a bacteria onto a McConkie plate and it doesn't grow, you know that that bacteria is gram positive. Okay, if you streak a an unknown bacteria onto a McConkie plate and it does grow, you know that it must be gram negative. And furthermore, if you streak it on the plate and it grows and it's pink, you know that it's a lactose fermenter. If it's gray, you know that it's a lactose non-fermenter. So here we have a plate that, that's been divided. This is a McConkie plate that's divided into three, into, uh, sorry, into four, four quadrants. And then somebody streaked four different types of bacteria onto here and numbered them one, two, three, and four. Okay, so what, would you, what can you tell me about number three? Okay, number three, you know that it is a gram-positive bacteria. It must have been a gram-positive bacteria because it didn't grow. Okay, now does that tell you whether the... You, so you know that it was a gram-positive bacteria. Does that tell you whether it was a lactose fermenter or not? And the answer is no, because there are some 
bacteria that are gram positive, but they still ferment lactose. Right? And uh, I may ask you on a quiz at some point, this is a fairly hard question because it relies on your remembering everything I've said, and I know that I talk a lot, but I, this relies on your remembering everything that I said. We have been introduced to a gram-positive bacteria that ferments lactose, but it is gram-positive. A gram-positive lactose fermenter, it would not grow on a McConkie plate, right? So if something doesn't, if something fails, if a bacteria fails to grow on a McConkie plate, the only thing that you can say about it is that it was gram-positive, but you cannot say whether it was a lactose fermenter or not, right? Do you remember the bacteria that I said was uh, a gram-positive lactose fermenter? If not, you can go back and look in the in the lecture. Okay, E. coli is a gram-negative lactose fermenter, so it would it would grow on these plates and it would it would turn pink as well. Okay, now what can you say about number four? Okay, so quadrant four, you can say two things. Number one, it must be a gram-negative bacteria. Number two, it must be a it must be a lactose non-fermenter. Right, what about number one? Okay, number one is a gram-negative bacteria that's a partial lactose fermenter. It ferments lactose a little bit, but not a lot. And number two is a gram-negative bacteria that's a very good lactose fermenter. So l number two might actually be E. coli. I don't know which was plated on these plates, but uh, E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria. It's a gram-negative rod that happens to be fairly good at fermenting lactose. Okay, so uh, this is what, what I was just talking about. I'm going to repeat it again. This is the difference between a selective versus a differential bacterial growth medium. Uh, remember the, the, the word medium, when you're talking about one particular type of growth medium, this is the singular form of that word. If you have two or more different types of media, then you would say media. That's the plural form. All right. Now, so if you plate bacteria on petri plates that are filled with food, a selective media will only permit one specific thing to grow. Example, gram-negative versus gram-positive bacteria. So McConkie media only allows gram-negative bacteria to grow. So McConkie media is classified as a selective media. There are, there are lots of others, but we're not going to go into any more in this course. McConkie is the most common uh, selective media that microbiologists use. Typically, if a uh, if you're working in a hospital lab, somebody comes in with a bacterial infection, they take a sample of sputum, you know, saliva, and they send it down to the lab, and your job is to figure out what it is if you're the medical laboratory technician. So your job is to figure out what it is. You would do, you would take four plates, you would take two blood agar plates, and you would take two McConkie plates, and then you would streak the sputum on all four of those plates, right? And then you would take one blood agar plate and one McConkie plate and you would put it in an aerobic incubator with oxygen. And then you would take the other blood agar plate and the other McConkie agar plate and put it in an anaerobic incubator. That's a nice warm box that gives it a nice warm temperature to grow, but it contains no oxygen. And the next day you would come back and you would take them all out and then you would look to see whether the, did the two plates that were in the oxygen incubator grow and the two that were in the anaerobic incubator didn't grow or the reverse, vice versa, right? So that would tell you instantly whether the bacteria is, a, is an anaerobe or is an aerobe or an anaerobe. Is it a, is it a, is it a facultative, is it an obligate aerobe or an obligate anaerobe? If it grew in both, what does that mean? If, it, if all four plates grew, Two of the plates were in an aerobic incubator, two of them were in an anaerobic incubator. What does that mean? It must mean that it's a facultative anaerobe. So it, it grows in oxygen or it can grow with or without oxygen. It's either a facultative anaerobe or a micro, uh, or a micro aero, uh, sorry, not a micro aerophile, but a, an aerotolerant anaerobe. It's one of those two. Okay, and then you look at the blood agar plates and you can answer the question whether it's an alpha, beta, or a gamma uh, hemolytic organism and then you look at the McConkie plate and you can answer the question is it gram positive or gram negative if it's gram positive you can't tell whether it's a lactose fermenter or not so you have to do other tests but if it if it grew there then you can tell that it's a lact it's a gram negative bacteria 
And if it if the colonies that are growing are pink or gray, you can tell whether it's a lactose fermenter or a lactose non-fermenter. That's typically that is the classical method that uh, a microbiology technician would use to identify a specific microorganism, a specific bacteria, in fact. Um, okay, then once you've determined that something is a is a you've determined that it's an obligate anaerobe, it's a gram-negative bacteria that ferments lactose then you would take some of that bacteria from the colony colony and you'd smear it onto a microscope slide and then you'd stain it and then you'd look at it to determine the shape is it a cocci is it a is it a bacillus if it's a cocci is it in clumps or is it in chains or is it in pairs or is it individual and then from then from the morphology you would determine exactly which bacteria it is Right. These days, see that whole process takes about two days to determine the identity of a bacteria that's in, causing an infection. By then, your patient may be dead, right? So there, there's got to be a faster way to do this. And today, there is a faster way to do this. Usually, they do PCR to identify genes present in the bacteria. Now, that doesn't help you if the bacteria is present at such small numbers that that the PCR reaction can't pick it up. In that case, you would have to grow it on plates or something like that. All right, so that was just an aside, a side discussion of the fact that McConkie agar is a selective media because it selects only, selective means that only the thing that you want is capable of growing on that particular medium. So McConkie is a selective medium because it is it only allows gram-negative cells to grow. Blood agar is not a selective medium because it grows, it allows both gram positive and gram negative to grow. Okay, differential means it allows everything to grow, but it also allows you to tell one thing from another, right? So uh, McConkie agar is both differential and selective. It's selective because it only allows gram negative to grow, but it's also differential because it allows you to tell the difference between lactose fermenters and lactose non fermenters as opposed to blood agar plates that are merely uh, differential and not selective because blood agar plates allow all bacteria to grow whether they're gram positive or negative but they do allow you to differentiate between bacteria that are alpha alpha hemolytic beta hemolytic and gamma hemolytic okay so McConkie plates are both selective and differential. They're selective because they only allow gram-negative cells to grow. They inhibit the growth of gram-positive cells. And they are also differential because they allow you to differentiate between lactose fermenters and non-fermenters. Blood agar plates are not selective, but they are differential because they allow, they allow you to differentiate between alpha, beta, and gamma hemolytic bacteria. Okay. Two more identity tests that are commonly carried out on an unknown bacteria. Number one is called the is called the coagulase test, and the other one is called the catalase test. Okay, coagulase and catalase. Some bacteria, particularly uh, particularly pathogenic bacteria, produce an enzyme called coagulase. Coagulation refers to going from, uh, you know, things coming together to form a clot, right? So you know that if you leave blood out in the air, it will coagulate, it will form a clot, a blood clot. Right? And uh, it's actually not the blood cells that are doing that, it's the serum, it's the blood serum that's doing that. So some uh, bacteria, particularly some nasty pathogenic bacteria, will actually cause the blood to clot which obviously is not good for you. It causes the blood plasma to clot. And so you want it, and so this coagulase is an enzyme. It's an enzyme that causes the uh, proteins in the serum to fuse together and form a, a solid clot. Okay, so one of the questions that if you're trying to identify a bacteria is you want to know if it produces coagulase enzyme or not. And so this is the protocol for the coagulase test. Uh, you put the bacteria, you put a little bit of a bacteria into a tube of blood serum, and then you look to see if it coagulates. You look to see if it forms a clump, right? And then you score the bacteria as being either coagulase positive, meaning it makes that the coagulase enzyme, or coagulase negative, meaning it did not make the coagulase enzyme. All right, so here we have two tubes of blood serum. On the right, you put in some bacteria and the serum is still a liquid after a few minutes. 
And the tube on the left, if you put in a little tiny bit of the bacteria, it has caused the serum to clot into this solid clot on the bottom. So the one on the right is coagulase negative. The one on the left is coagulase positive. All right, we already discussed the fact that, that um, if you mix oxygen with water, you sometimes get hydrogen peroxide, which is a very toxic compound. And some bacteria produce an enzyme, uh, it's basically a hydrogen peroxidase enzyme that, that is able to convert hydrogen peroxide back into oxygen and water. Uh, but if, if it's a, ba when bacteria produce uh, a hydrogen peroxidase enzyme, we call it a catalase enzyme. I don't know why they named it that, but the enzyme that converts hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide back into water and oxygen if it's a bacteria that's producing it, we call the enzyme catalase, catalase. So if we want to tell whether or not the bacteria is producing this enzyme or not, only some bacteria do produce it. If we want to determine whether a bacteria is producing it or not, we do something called the catalase test. And the protocol for the catalase test is you spread the bacteria onto a glass slide, and then you drop a few drops of hydrogen peroxide on top of it, and if it fizzes, if it makes bubbles, it means that it's producing the catalase enzyme. And that is what's causing, you know, hydrogen peroxide is a liquid, and that causes the hydrogen peroxide to turn into water and molecular oxygen, which is a gas. And so it bubbles. It literally fizzes like it was soda pop or something like that, like it was a soft drink. Right, and then you score the bacteria as being catalase positive if it did fizz and catalase negative if it did not. There's the catalase test. So you draw, you take a wax pencil and you draw it on two slides, or you draw it on a slide, right? And then you put a drop of, uh, you smear some of the bacteria inside the wax pencil uh, boundary. The green, uh, sorry, the wax pencil, because it's a wax pencil, if you put liquid onto it, the liquid can't run out. It does, generally doesn't run out of the circle. So that's a way of containing the, the liquid inside this circle. So you take a glass slide, you draw a circle on it with a wax pencil, you smear some of the bacteria into the glass slide, and then you drop a drop of hydrogen peroxide on top of it. You can buy hydrogen peroxide at any drugstore. Uh, any pharmacy. Uh, it's, it's used for all kinds of things. So you drop a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. If it does not fizz, that means that particular bacteria does not make the catalase enzyme. If it fizzes like this one, then it does. And so you would score this one up here as catalase positive and this one down here as catalase negative. Right, so we've so far in this lecture, we've learned how to, to categorize bacteria based on whether they're gram positive or gram negative on whether they are rods, bacilli, uh, vibrio, etc. We've also learned to tell, categorize them based on whether they form chains or whether they form uh, diploids or whether they form sarcinia or those the arrangement of the cells. And then we've learned ways to categorize them based on whether or not they can use oxygen. And then we've We've categorized them based on what temperature they can live at. We've we've categorized them based on what they can eat. Can they lyse blood? Are they alpha, beta, gamma hemolytic? And now we're we're categorizing them based on whether or not they produce coagulase or catalase enzymes. So there are quite a few tests that you can do to identify a specific bacteria. And as I said, this is the way that we used to identify bacteria probably for a hundred years. So for a hundred years, whenever somebody was getting sick from a bacteria, this is the way they would identify it. Mostly in the last 70 or 80 years, some of these tests weren't invented until the 1930s and 40s, but generally for the last century or so, uh, this is the way we identified these bacteria. These methods are still used in laboratories all around the world, which is why we're learning about them. But as I said, these methods have kind of given way to PCR. Uh, in countries that have lots of money to spend, they, they buy a lot of PCR machines to do these experiments. PCR machines are ridiculously expensive. They cost twenty or thirty thousand dollars. So this is so so you know if if you're someplace where they have lots of money to do these kind of analytics, then they would do do PCR. If you're in a place where they don't have a lot of money, you would probably be doing these other tests with blood agar plates and so on. All right, so to summarize everything that we've learned about how to categorize bacteria, 
we do it by cell shape. We ask whether they have a, whether the cells are a bacillus, a coccus, a coccobacilli, a vibrio, a spirillum, a spirochete, or whether they are pleomorphic. Then we ask about the cell arrangements, whether they arrange themselves in pairs or chains or clusters or whether they're just individual. We also learned about some other cell features that you can look at. Do they have flagella? If they do have flagella, are they, how are they arranged? Are they all at one end? Is there one flagella only? Is it monotricious, lophotricious, amphitricious, amphilophotricious? Uh, do they have a glycocalyx of some sort? Do they produce endospores the way bacillus, uh, uh, Clostridium bacillus does or bacillus anthraxis does? Can they, uh, swimming, we just explaining what they do with the flagella. There are some very simple, inexpensive ways to determine the GC content of a bacteria, uh, bacterial DNA. I mentioned the fact that PCR is a method that you use to look for certain specific genes within a bacteria. It turns out that that's very expensive, but it's relatively simple and relatively cheap to determine how much uh, GC content an organism has. Right. Uh, that's uh, I, I won't get into the test. It's basically you melt, you heat the DNA up, and then you see how long it takes for the the two single strands to come back together. The two single strands will come back together faster if it has a higher GC content. It's a fairly simple test, and it's fairly inexpensive. All right, we learned how to categorize bacteria based on the conditions they live in. Do they like to eat lots of food versus less? So that's eutrophs versus oligotrophs. Are they mesophiles versus extremophiles? Do they like to live in a, in a neutral pH environment versus an acid or an alkaline environment? Do they like to live in areas where there's high pressure? Barophiles do, do that. High temperatures, if they like high temperatures, they're thermophiles. If they like low temperatures, they're psychrophiles. What does halophiles mean? Do you remember that one? Halophiles refers to a very salty environment because salts are also halogens. And then also, how do they deal with oxygen? Are they obligate aerobes, obligate anaerobes, and so forth? Okay, uh, what can they eat? So can they lyse blood cells and eat the contents? And if so, do we classify them as alpha, beta, or gamma hemolytic? Gamma hemolytic cells are bacteria that cannot lyse blood cells at all. Uh, do they produce co coagulase and catalase? And can they ferment lactose? We learned about the difference between McConkie agar plates, regular agar plates, McConkie agar plates, and blood agar plates. Okay, now, thank you for listening to all of that. Now, the next lecture that we're gonna discuss is we're going to learn the names of some of the most important bacterial phyla. Don't be intimidated by all the names. Uh, just, start, just start memorizing them, and you just have to memorize them enough to recognize them on MCQ questions, multiple choice questions. But we will go through the, a number of them, right? And so the, the number that you're able to memorize is, is how we determine, that's basically how we uh, differentiate between regular students and gifted students by the number that you can memorize and, and the number of things that you can memorize and the, the amount of information that you can absorb and then use to solve problems and things like that. So the next lecture, we're going to, we're going to uh, begin a series of four lectures where we discuss the important bacterial phyla then the important uh, protists, the important fungi, and the important helminths, and then we'll move on to viruses. Okay, thank you very much.